ਜਾਇਆ ਕੋਈ ਉੱਥੇ ਅੱਜ ਕੋਈ ਆਇਆ Hello, sir. Thank you so much for joining today. Hello, sir. I can see you. Hello sir welcome to the to the webinar thank you so much for joining us today Sir can you see uh, can you hear me Hi sir Yes hello hi I know. Hi sir Hi, sir. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing great, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I hope you are doing well. Happy Father's Day to you. Oh, it's thank you so much. <laughs> so I had to start earlier because I need to be free for, for lunchtime. Sure, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, I know, and again, sorry uh, for bothering you on such an important day. I'm really sorry about it. So please, I think you can you, you should proceed with it. The record, I will also play the recording in the evening uh, uh, part two. So again, uh, sir, we are really honored to have welcomed you here today. I think that, uh, sir, uh, um, I think... Um, you I want to start be... now or let's, let's wait for nine o'clock or 2 p.m.? Sir, it's okay. It's it, it's totally okay. You are just nine minutes earlier, so you can start now because I can totally understand that you uh, that you have to uh, leave today early to obviously to have okay. lunch with your kids. I'll, I'll be back in a minute, okay? Sure, sir. I'll be, sure, back, sir. In, I'll be back in a minute. Thank you so much, sir.
Okay, in the meantime, um, I'm pleased to introduce Professor um, Oscar Elf. Obviously, we all know him very well and we are all big fans of him. So Professor Oscar Elf is the head of neurosurgery in Hospital Luciados in Porto, Portugal. He's a senior consultant in neurosurgery at Central Hospital Rara de Goya, Espanha, and he's a Fulbright Fellow. He's a board member of the Cervical Spine Research Society. He's the ES board member of Spine Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, the WFNS. He's the editorial board member of Archivos Brasileiros de Neurochirurgia is a postdoc associate in neurosurgery in Medical College of Virginia in the United States. He's assistant professor in neurosurgery in Hôpital La Rue La Rougerie at Université de Paris, France, Institute of Neurological Science, Classical UK. So we are really pleased and honored to uh, welcome him today for so kind of him to uh, allow us to hold this meeting today. And uh, I hope you will all enjoy it and uh, like uh, uh, like the lecture, sir. Thank you very, very much for joining us today and for the honor of accepting our invitation to deliver the lecture. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, Noor. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this uh, webinar. It's really important, especially in low and middle income countries, to raise awareness of uh, traumatic brain injury. Thank you very, very much, sir. Especially your topic is very is uh, of great interest, especially in our uh, in our setup. So again, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. So my 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 lecture is on uh, the compressive craniectomy in TBI. Uh, can it save lives? And I work in in, in Porto, Portugal. Um. First of all, uh, these are my disclosures on this topic of TBI. Here it's me with Professor Ross Bullock, which was uh, and still is my mentor, and, and we have very tight friendship. And everything I know, uh, TBI, and, and also what I call the academic approach to, 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 to neurosurgery in general, I, I own that to, to Professor Bullock. And this is a, a slide that I show quite often. Uh, and this is the crease of mortality in TBI, in severe head injury patients uh, from uh, early 80s to late 90s. And you see that the, 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 the mortality uh, was reduced by half. Um, and this was not related with a magic bullet, with a magic uh, therapeutic. It was just that in Richmond, in Medical College of Virginia, they start an academic program of, of traumatic uh, brain injury. And this is, uh, makes all the difference. Um, and if you apply to this, to neurosurgery in general, you, you will have a real impact on the outcome of patients. You know, you, you anticipate problems, you diagnose problems, you discuss with the team. Um, you know, that's, that's really, really important to have this approach. And all this I, I learned with Professor Bullock. Uh, decompressive craniectomy, uh, it's really an old technique, as you see here from Cocker in the, in the early 20th century, when there was a brain pressure, uh, then pressure needs to be relieving, released by uh, achieving the opening of the skull. It's really an old technique, but unfortunately, for different reasons that I will talk later, was not yet, uh, is not yet validated in clinical trials. What's the main problem after traumatic brain injury uh, besides intracranial hematomas? It's really the brain, the brain edema. And from patients with GOS 1 and 2, it's a universal phenomena. 85% of those patients somehow, uh, they develop brain edema, malignant brain edema. Um, and what, what's, what's the, the pathophysiologic cascade related with brain edema? Brain edema raises ICP, which is, decreases cerebral blood flow and oxygen delivery and substrate delivery. This leads to energy failure and again contributes to brain swelling. And each one of those steps can lead to brain injury. Uh, there is an effect of raised ICP on mortality and functional recovery. And this was shown very nicely in 1991 by Bill Berger, showing that the raised ICP adversely affects functional outcome. Look at here, patients with sustained ICP higher than 45, 
almost all, all of them died. Whereas if you have ICP lower than 20, 40% chance of surviving on those days. So it, this is where the limit of 20 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury of ICP comes from. If you look at the, the if you look at the, this is very important uh, slide. If you look at the classification of intracranial injury, traumatic injury according to the Marshall classification, you have one, two, three, four, uh, and, and mass evacuated mass lesion or non evacuated mass lesion. But if you look at here to the center on the Marshall tree, you have a swelling. That's the main radiological uh, appearance on, on CT scans. You have a scan like this where basal systems are completely effaced. And look, the incidence of intracranial pressure in, this, in those patients is really high, uh, above 60%. And the outcome of those patients, it's divided between good outcomes and bad outcomes. So in my opinion, these are the patients that you should really pay big attention because they are the ones who can lose a lot if you don't treat them well. If you go for a, a type four, a lot of patients will have bad results. If you have a type one, most of them, they tend to do well. So this is the really the, the gray zone, the gray area where you should have, you should be very, very, very careful. What's the beneficial effect of, uh, of craniectomy, the rationale behind it? You know, this is ICP, intracranial volume pressure, the compliance uh, volume, uh, pressure volume uh, curve. By doing a, a decompressive craniectomy, you, you shift this curve to the right side. So you have uh, less uh, intracranial pressure for uh, small uh, intracranial, for, for higher intracranial volumes which is the case of brain edema. So it has no impact no, on, on ICP if you do a craniectomy and you can like that protect the areas of, of penumbra. Uh, you see here that uh, uh, there is a, a beneficial effect on ICP after uh, the compressive craniectomy and uh, also better, better uh, CPP and a better uh, compliance. And this is basically what is shown on this uh, uh, Decker trial published in New England Journal, where you see that uh, between uh, decompressive craniectomy and, and medical treatment, uh, intracranial pressure was much better, much better controlled, and also the mean uh, uh, fusion pressure. And all the meta-analysis that uh, all the papers shown, uh, as shown on this meta-analysis show an effective control of ICP by doing a decompressive connectivity. And this effect is long lasting. Here, ICP measure 48 hours after decompressive craniectomy compared to preoperative values, you see also a shift in favor of treatment. Effect on, on CPP favors also uh, compressive, uh, decompressive craniectomy. And what is the rational? By doing a, a DC, you decrease ICP, you, you improve uh, CPP, there is some effect of vasoconstriction, and all this leads to reduction of the, of the blood volume. So increase on flow, on microvascular perfusion on both hemispheres, elevation of brain tissue uh, oxygen, and, and normalization of all metabolic ischemical markers. Um, you have acceptable CPP level that can be achieved with a lower mean arterial pressure, which means reduction of amine loads and associated risks. So by doing a decompressive craniectomy, you can reduce a lot the intensive care treatment load, either, either amines or barbiturates. Look at here, the surgical group, only 9.4% of patients needed barbiturates, whereas in the medical treatment group, 87%. So it's 10 times more, roughly 10 times more, which is really a very a, a huge difference. Uh, also, this very nice paper from your country, uh, Noor, from Pakistan, published last year, uh, a randomized control trial, showed that the mean duration of mechanical ventilation in the, in the craniotomy group was smaller, mean days of stay on, on the ICU, uh, in the hospital, and the mortality at, at, at six months. 
effect on mortality favors decompressive craniectomy, a lower risk of death compared with, uh, with non-DC patients. Well, but then there is a problem. You rescue patients from being dead, but uh, as shown by the Decker trial published in 2011, uh, you increase uh, the number of, of severe vegetative and severe disability patients. And you can have uh, around 70% with the uh, decompressive craniectomy, like you see here in this curve, or around 50% with, with standard treatment. And if you look at the functional outcome, the rates of death at six and 12 months were similar in, in, the, in the compressive, the compressive craniectomy, but uh, with also uh, worse uh, Glasgow outcome scores for, for uh, vegetative cases and, and uh, severe disability cases. Uh, I think children are an exception on this. It's not really like adults. So it's really worse to do uh, um, compressive craniectomies in children. But for me, this means really a paradox. How uh, DC is the most effective treatment in reducing ICP, and there is no uh, proven effects on functional outcome in severe TBI. Uh, this looks like a kind of paradox. Um, and probably the reason is because you increase intravascular pressure, this can lead to increased brain edema. And, and the people from Lund, we were able to show that in some patients, intravascular pressure increase leads to more brain edema. So it has the, 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 the non-expected effect. Also, if the cerebral autoregulation is impaired, there is also worsening of edema. So it's important uh, to have some idea about the autoregulation of the patient before uh, doing the compressive connection. Or of course, you can have a perfusion syndrome, hyperemia, uh, in decompressed brain uh, with vasolotonia and, and leads to, to changes in autoregulation. Uh, whenever you do a decompressive craniectomy, you have to remind also about complications. Uh, and the, the increase in brain compliance following bone, bone removal can reflect, as I showed before, in cerebral blood flow, in autoregulation, in CSF dynamics, and this will bring complications. They, they are acute complications. Uh, like blossom of confusion, the epidural hematomas, that these are ultra earlier, um, epilepsy, uh, CSF leakage. You have in the first month, you can have subdural effusions or, or, or hygromas, uh, evolution of contralateral mass, on, and also the late complications uh, related with, with cranioplasty. So remember, anytime you do a decompressive craniectomy, you have to do a cranioplasty later. And this is another procedure. That which also can cause complications. And as you see here, pretty much all the series being published show uh, figures, important figures of, of, uh, of complications that I estimate an overall rate of 40%. And this would adds also and also explains why we don't see as much as good outcomes as we expected by just doing a, a decompression. Um, and you see that this paper published in, in Egypt last year, what are the predictors of early mortality? Uh, it, so it shows that uh, except for post-operative hematoma, more complications happen in uh, patients that survive. Hydrocephalus, uh, CSF leak, wound infection, skin flap ischemia. So, you know, these are the complications that you can have. The novel mass lesions after a, bi a bifrontal uh, craniectomy, you have uh, intracerebral hematomas, you have these subdural hygromas. Um, and this can reach important figures. Uh, this author found 58% in expansion of the, oh, the novel brain confusion, or even contralateral uh, hemorrhage by the effect of decompression. You can you interfere a lot with CSF dynamics. You have the sinking uh, skin flap syndrome, like you see here, which are awful uh, situations and hard to, to solve, and also uh, important type of uh, Another complication comes from the area of decompression, and this is surgery, surgeon dependent. It depends on your technique. 
and this is something that you it's on your end that you should you should improve. You can have brain herniation through the the the, the, craniotomy, the craniotomy area, and which brings external stretching as you see here in this cartoon, and also uh, cortical veins compression at the borders of of the bone flap. So. Be very careful whenever you see these kind of images on your CT scan. Exons are being really stretched. They will become, you induce some sort of external uh, injury. And also the veins compressed here at the borders of the flex. Now look here, the brain herniation due to inadequate decompression. Uh, what is the best area of decompression? The size of the decompression? If you do too large, you risk hydrocephalus, subdural collection, skin flap sinking, and paradoxal herniation. If you do it small, you have inadequate compression, compression brain herniation, and brain ischemia due to uh, vessel uh, compression. So it looks like 14 centimeters, square centimeter, is the, the, the area that you should be compressed to gain uh, some some beneficial effect. It's a very important study published in 2016. They do the, they, they audit in Switzerland the area of, of, uh, of decompression of the craniectomy. And look at the size, it's very different size, it's not a standard size of, of decompression. Uh, the mean AP diameter was 8.4 only. Uh, 40, only 43% 40 of patients had a bone flap higher than 12 centimeters. Uh, only 61% of patients had a complete temporal decompression. And this is really an important topic. You to bring your decompressive craniectomy real low to the temporal lobe to release the uncles and the compression on brain stem. And they estimated, and this is a shame for us, for surgeons, that 22% of mortality rate and 50% of complication rate was related to technical error. Most of the time, insufficient area of decompression and uh, no temporal decompression. So sufficient area to decompress the temporal lobe. Uh, less than 12 centimeter, square centimeters increase the chance of brain injury and poor outcome. So the ideal size is somewhere between 12 and 14 uh, square centimeters. What about timing? The time that you, you perform your decompressive craniectomy is, 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 is very important. The sooner you do it, the better outcomes you have. It's like here in group one and group two, or the same graphic here shown that doing earlier as a first year um, theoretical approach, survival and long-term long outcomes are superior to medical management when the procedure is performed 48 hours of injury rather than a salvage therapy. Don't do it too late. If you do it earlier, do you increase the complication rate? Not really. This paper shows you that between earlier and delayed decompressive craniectomy, the range of surgical related complications for meningitis or septic shock is really the same. Uh, there are prognostic factors that are patient dependent like this paper from Iran, those that older than 60 and GCS lower than five, patients have to have uh, worse outcomes, not really midline shift um, and not uh, the size of people. Again, this paper shows that more than 50 years old is bad prognostic factor and patient selection is a prerogative of the surgeon of the field. So in, on your end also, as a surgeon to choose the right patient in terms of age to operate. And look here, the functional outcome above and, and below and above six years old. Another important uh, prognostic factor is that needs admission DCS, which is patient dependent, but again, it's up to you uh, to, to, to decide which patients you're gonna choose for a surgery. Initial Glasgow, Again, you see higher admission, DCS, less mortality, and better functional outcome, as it's expected. Uh, this patient from EPID uh, last year, uh, early mortality after decompressive uh, 
Phenecamine mean patients with severe TBI, 104 patients, around 30% of mortality, and this was in, in, in relation with lower DCS score with uh, the, the, the Marshall classification uh, and with the, the, the fact that there are extracranial uh, injuries. Of course, if you have uh, primary lesions, as, so as reflected by the Marshall classification, you can have also very, very bad results. What can you do for, for the compressive connectivity? You can do what is called the hemispheric, this kind of, of opening. You expose a substantial area of the brain. You do, you do, uh, uh, do uh, an opening of, of the dura. You can cover with a layer. You can do a duroplasty, whatever you want. Remember that you, you have to create a barrier between the brain and the skull, because we will come later on to, to do a cranioplasty. And like this, we do really large uh, connections to preserve uh, the vein from compression. You can also do bifrontal decompression, like here, a coronal, uh, the coronal incision, and go and do the, 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 the bifrontal connection. Uh, this is more for diffuse injuries without midline sheet. Uh, and it's really important uh, that you should also cut the interior valve. Otherwise, this will create uh, still pressure, despite the fact that you open the dura and you take the bone and you open the dura. So this was very elegantly shown by a paper by Salfilio, that if you, if you do a section of the uh, superior uh, sinus here, the anterior sinus and the fox, section and division, you have a much better control of the ICP. So as a definition and indications in TBI, you can do it as a, as a secondary decompression and the DECA trial in row 155 patients with a severe diffuse TBI uh, within 72 hours. Um, ICP raised more than 20 for 15 minutes. Uh, and the second trial that was done was at the last year, the rescue therapy. This was the rescue ICP trial, more patients, but uh, the raise of, of, of ICP was probably too long. Uh, ICP raised more than 35 or 460 units. Uh, and then you can have also what is called the primary decompressive penectomy, which is the one that you were doing when you were doing a confusion on a good sub uh, drainage you decide or not to leave uh, the, the bone flat. Uh, this paper is, is quite important and shows that post-operative ICP was better controlled and patients of outcome were better in the center, it's also a VCU, Medical College of Virginia, uh, with a greater utilization of decompression of primary uh, uh, decompressive craniotomy uh, after evacuation of, of acute subdural. And again, for me, this is probably the most compelling uh, information, piece of information regarding the value of the compressive brain activity. In this study, patients that were equated in acute subdural and added the compressive connectomy on top of that were TCS uh, worse and more intracranial injury of liberated basal system on the initial CT. And nevertheless, they did better than the patients who had only drainage on, 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 on the acute subdural hematoma. This is just of one of our cases, an example. You can, there are a, a different options, different, uh, different uh, criteria to uh, add a decompressive phenectomy after evacuating an acute subdural. You can look at the zinc bronchial uh, ratio, which is the, the, the the deviation of midline and compared to the to the thickness of the hematoma. Whenever the deviation of midline is bigger than than the, the, the thickness of the hematoma, you might be doing a, you might wish to add a, a decompressive connection. Also, if during your operation you see brain swelling, massive brain swelling after the evacuation of, of uh, your acute subdural, it's also a good indication. To do a compressive craniectomy. So, when defining the optimal time, what were the problems 
with the trials that were done. The DECRA trial, as I told you, uh, they did decompressive craniectomies with very mild transient intracranial hypertension. And probably you, did, you overdid. You did, they did more craniectomies they, that were necessary. Um, and this was probably too invasive to benefit patients with not uh, so uh, pronounced elevation of ICD. And if you do very liberally decompressive, decompressive craniectomies, you probably not see an effect over not treatment. So this was this is my main criticism with, with DECRA. And this was from pre swelling and mainly by frontal um, decompressive craniectomy. In the rescue ICP, it was done too late, in my opinion. Uh, last year, uh, decompressive uh, craniectomy, uh, of course, reduces mortality, but reduces more vegetative state and severe disability patients. This was a too conservative indication for decompressive craniectomy uh, when patients probably had already uh, irreversible brain damage. So you need something more than just right threshold for, for ICP, in my opinion. It's not the most powerful indicator for neurological worsening. And we need to work out on models that can predict outcome based on age, on motor response, on PCS, on pupil reactivity, on the Marshall scan. And nowadays we have multimodality monitoring like PTO2, microdialysis, but especially PTO2 is, is quite important. And you can decide whether or not to do a decompressive craniectomy based on your PTO2 level. And, and of course, this is not only a procedure, you need a sound postoperative intensive care environment. And despite that, if you do subgroup analysis, still in severe TBI, you have an important number of survivors if you do a, a decompressive craniectomy. So let me go very quickly here over some cases, case clinical case one, primary indications, then uh, acute subdural hematoma, a 46 year old man, uh, eve of Christmas at a fall, severe headache, TCS um, 15, very quick uh, deterioration to TCS 6, left hemiparesis, no other injuries, important comorbidities that is here for a young patient. And this is the, the, the scan where you see a huge midline shift, uh, an acute subdural with mass effect. And also you can guess this is bleeding because there are different densities of, of, of blood. Uh, INR was, of course was normalized with post-combined complex before the procedure. And it was a cortical artery that was bleeding. We drained the, the subdural hematoma. We did a decompressive craniectomy and the augmentation duroplasty. ICP uh, normal values uh, for, for and ICP monitoring was discontinued by day five, excavated with GCS 11. This is the, the scan, the immediate post op scan, where still some midline shift, but ICP was, was normal. And patient was discharged 15 days after surgery with this really nice uh, uh, CT scan with a DCS of 13 and a grade four left hemiparesis. Intensive rehabilitation and last follow up is 15, recovered from hemiparesis, is walking and has more or less quite a normal life. And this is the, 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 the craniopathy that we have done. And these are the good cases, the ones that you, young patients, Quick deterioration, you have a high suspicion rate, and you go immediately for for, for the compression of the subdural and the compressive connection. Another lady, six years old, on warfin, fall downstairs, PCS 15, INR4. Uh, this was her initial scan, uh, really minor subarachnoid hemorrhage on the right frontal uh, cortical frontal lobe, no other lesions. But uh, next day, 9 a.m., 9.30 a.m., neuro worsening, PCS 11, left hemiparesis. And look at this awful scan with traumatic intercerebral hematoma, which with a, with a great volume. She was taken to, to the OR. The compressive connectomy was added to the, to the removal of the confusions of hematoma. 
and one hour after surgery to clear this uh, really nice uh, post operative image. No further complications. Three months later, bone flap was repositioned with a, with a, with a craniopathy. Sometimes we we keep the bone flaps on on the, the abdominal cavity. Uh, if this is prone to infection. Probably not 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 a good a good, a good anymore. Not a good decision, and she had a good recovery. This is one of the most important cases, the Marshall three cases. Don't remember other ones with brain swelling, the ones that 50 of them can have good outcomes and 50% can have bad outcomes. And these are the ones that have much to lose if you don't detect uh, raising the cranial pressure and you don't, if you don't do the compressive craniectomy in time. Uh, high velocity trauma on a 46 year old, year old uh, male, uh, GCS7, Symmetric localization to stimulus, pupils uh, were normal, hemothorax from broken ribs, and uh, also a broken left femur. That's our initial scan. This is uh, Marshall P, as you see, uh, right uh, temporal and frontal confusions, but effacement of, of, of the, the sulci and uh, the system that you see here, everything is shut down. So it's a Marshall P. We did it immediately a bilateral and hemispheric uh, compressive connectomy, as you see here, and ICP monitoring, uh, because ICP monitoring, there was spikes despite many tone. P1 wave similar to P2 wave it was dependent on on, uh, on dobotamine to have good uh, in arterial pressure. The patient improved. Sedation was win by day uh, 16, uh, progression and Cranioplasty was performed on day 72 and discharged on day 70, 78. We really a good scan at the time, but unfortunately, the patient died uh, four months later with a pneumonia. So these are really the cases that you feel terrible because you've done a good job, but you lose the patient. Uh, Marshall, two cases, 55, overrun by a car, GCS 30, 10. Immediately sedated due to agitation and transferred to the ho or hospital. Uh, left frontal confusion, all systems still open. ICP catheter was inserted. P1 wave uh, equal to P2 wave, showing that there was borderline compliance of the brain, uh, increase of spikes, uh, and not responding to hyperosmolar therapy. Raised ICP, and we decided to go, and this the scan shows. Uh, more effacement of the of the sulci, and we decided to do a left uh, hemispheric uh, decompressive craniectomy. And midline shift was solved by day seven, and the patient uh, improved. And um, by day uh, day forty one, had the, the cranioplasty done, and this is a good result for this patient. Uh, this is a case with 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 a surgical complication, fall with occipital trauma, less than an hour before evacuation. Uh, fourteen, this is fourteen, no focal deficit, uh, INR two point two. This is the scan of the patient. Day two, deterioration. This is seven. Uh, the pills were not really reacting, and this uh, this uh, midline shift this onchoderniation. And this is an overview of the, of the scan. A good uh, drainage of the subdural with the compressive craniectomy. This is an image from, uh, from the OR. We always leave a, a catheter uh, after the surgery, and the uh, end pressure was seven uh, millimeters of mercury. And look at this. Despite we have done a good selection of patients, a good um, a good decompression in the patient has a, has a major stroke and unfortunately had a very bad prognosis. 27 years old male, car accident, uh, GCS6 on site, mesocoric, uh, alcohol consumption, was trapped inside the car for 30 minutes, not allowing resuscitation. Uh, this is a depressed skull fracture greater than the thickness of the bone. With the right uh, sided uh, convexity of the subdural, also a bit on interhemispheric over the total ozone, bilateral sulci uh, uh, 
placement. And this is the, the indication for surgery because we need to deprive to raise the, the depressive fracture. But look, the patient developed <coughs> important intraoperative edema. So we decide to do uh, also uh, decompressive bilateral frontal uh, decompressive craniectomy. And look here, just by incising the, 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 the sinus and the faults, which is really important. And this is the, the, the scan with good decompression and drainage of hematomas, no new increased confusion. Uh, skin cleft depressive, no infection, no extracranial herniation. Uh, this is uh, after we did, we did a, a cranioplasty with, a, with good results. And this is a, a really important case. It was not one of my cases, but done in our department. 53 years old male, fall from his own height, acute uh, alcoholic intoxication, loss of consciousness higher than five minutes, initial GCS 14, during CT acquisition, uh, uh, dramatic fall to GCS 6. And this is the scan. Marshall 4, bilateral confusions, hyperacute subdural hematoma, midline sheath, systems obliterated, uh, really um, awful scan as you see here. Well, the patient was taken to the OR as an emergency basis with a left decompressive craniectomy and, and neuroplasty with good control of ICP and CPTR than 70. And this is the wrong scan, but uh, oh, I'm sorry. there was a problem here. I mixed up things. But actually, what happened is um, the patient had a second decompressive craniectomy on the right side and died. So it's really important when you have a surgical tool on your hands to know when to not intervene. Uh, your X ray shows a broken rib, you can fix it with Photoshop. Surgery is not Photoshop, it has really important ethical implications, and you should not. Uh, act according to the rescue law, because you know that the patient is going to die, it's a young patient, we have to do something. No, I mean, this patient had awful confusion and was not the case for, for surgery. Just remember that you have to do uh, cranioplasty, you know, not only for aesthetic, aesthetic reasons, but also protect the brain from, from external compression and above all to improve uh, CSF dynamics and, and cerebral blood flow. You can do it with the uh, with, uh, with, uh, Bone, bone cement, uh, peak, titanium plates, whatever you want. Uh, in my opinion, it should be done as early as possible. We see that patients can improve dramatically from neurology if you do it uh, sometimes very early. You can reduce uh, post operative rates of hydrocephalus. Uh, does not increase the rate of infection by the earlier. You can use the healthcare cost and you prevent uh, this awful sinking thing flap uh, syndrome. So all technique, not yet validated in clinical trials, but it's something that we could do. Uh, clinical trial failure, failure to show uh, superiority in the outcome. I don't think this is a technique problem. It's more that the, the, the studies that were published that very heterogeneous population, the studies designed were not the best. Um, choice of surgical approach is probably not the best. And different uh, medical treatment loads between different departments in multi-center studies. Uh, outcomes are worse when you do it as a rescue therapy. So go for neuroprotection instead of salvage procedure. Uh, improve your patient selection, uh, perform less invasive here, DCS less than five bilateral fixed dilated cryptos. Uh, do it more in, in good scores, would it be rated over the first hours after admission or when ICP becomes refractory to medical treatment. <clears throat> Bad outcomes relate undoubtedly about with, with insufficient area of decompression and temporal decompression. So please do larger flaps. This is essential to improve outcome. Remember, this is a thin decision. It's not only a surgeon decision. You need sound postoperative ICU. It's not an isolated tool. It needs to be integrated on a care protocol to treat raised ICP. Multimodality uh, monitoring in a dedicated neural ICU. 
we train staff uh, that can be very easily, uh, quickly, uh, clinically related. We know for sure that less morbidity than second tier uh, options like uh, uh, barbiturates. And remember that this is a procedure that has its own complications. So it can effectively save lives, but sometimes with a cost, survives a, a, a wide range of possible outcomes, including uh, high rates of dependence. So it's really important to open the discussion with the family. Um, because if you're producing a vegetative patient or highly dependent patient, this is really unacceptable for some patients and even for, for the families in the long run. So thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, it was really a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Uh, hello, sir. Yes, hello, Noor. Yes, hello. I, I, yes, I'm really sorry. Actually, we have uh, some surveillance going on right now, so we have some internet issues from Pakistan. I'm in Pakistan right now, so I'm sorry. I was uh, I was uh, disconnected in the middle. No worries. Uh, I mean, if you if there are any questions on the chat, I can answer them. I was looking here. Exactly. No, 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 thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, exactly. Dr. John Bennett has also messaged me in the meantime because I was disconnected, so I'm using my mobile net now. So, okay, sir, uh, the, thank you very much for the very interesting and nice lecture. Sir, I do have one question about it. Um, uh, personally, sir, there is uh, also the option of decompressing craniotomy, the hinge faulting craniotomy. So what's your opinion regarding this? Because they say that it's the, the results are quite comparable and it's very promising since the bone type is still there inside. So what do you think about decompressive craniotomy versus decompressive craniectomy? Right, I mean, the, the, whenever you do a decompressive craniotomy, you, you don't need to do later a craniopathy. You, you have the bone already there. Um, but I think, I think the the results, uh, they are not really the, uh, the same. I mean, you get, you you have much better outcomes, much better control of ICP, of CSF blood flow by doing uh, a decompressive connection. Of course, then you have the problem of reconstruction, but in my opinion, that's what needs to, to be done. Now. There are other publications, other groups doing inch craniotomy, where basically yes. you create the inch and you leave uh, the, the, the bone flap some, somehow floating, just attached to the one side. Um, you know, but th th this is, we never did it and I don't see a lot of logic behind it. I think you are in mood. Sir, there is a question in the chat box uh, regarding, so what should be the size of an ideal craniectomy for acute uh, subdural hematoma, ASDH? Right, if you, do, if you do a craniectomy as a primary indication, whenever you are dealing with uh, an acute subdural or brain confusion, uh, if you, as I showed, if you see that the, the, the deviation of midline is superior to the thickness of the hematoma, you should be prepared to do a decompressive craniectomy. And it should be around 14 square centimeters. And also uh, bring it really down uh, to, to, the, to the temporal area. This is a really important uh, situation. As I showed, too big also can be a problem because you can run in, in CSF, uh, 
circulation problems in hydrocephalus, in hygromas. I, I think somewhere around 14, 15, it's, it's really an, uh, the right target. The more difficult is the decision when you do, for example, a, a contusionectomy, just removal of a contusion or, or the hematoma. Uh, probably you don't need such a big uh, clap, uh, but it's, it's an option to do it. And, and even there are papers showing that you don't, if you don't remove the contusion, you, you do just a large decompressive penectomy, you can have also very good results if you do, don't touch the contusion. Great, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, there's also studies about cystinostomy. So what do you think about cystinostomy? Do you have any, um, uh, for what would be your way regarding cystinostomies? Right. You know, I, I, I know that, that Professor Hype Chirian is a very fan of uh, cystinostomy. Uh, to be honest, uh, I tried once and it was really hard to, to get the basal systems in, in those patients. You, basal systems are completely squeezed. Um, you, 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 in order to, to reach them, you, 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 go, you have to split very wounded brain, uh, very confused brain. Even if you are a really expert surgeon in cranial brain surgery and vascular surgery, I think you have a hard time hard time doing this, do, doing this procedure, and I doubt you gain much, because if you, if you, if you look at the Moro Kelly theory, the CSF uh, space is the first that you lose when you have raised intercranial pressure. So I don't see the point, go and open cisterns where there is no more CSF around. So I've, I have a lot of criticism on, on this, and, uh, and I think it's um, a surgery only if you are a really experienced vascular and cranial based surgeon, and I do a lot of those surgeries, and I tried to do it once in one of my patients, and, and I mean, it was there. Well, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't reach, I couldn't do any proper job. And that has, has, had no effect on, on intracranial pressure at all. Thank you very much, sir, because many of the surgeons that I have met also share your opinion as well. So I think there are multiple opinions. But so far, what I have seen that uh, while there is also always a space to change and update things, but the conventional neurosurgery is what most of the people really recommend still. So I think this is what uh, it, what the procedures that have tested the, you know, the, stood the test of time. So I think this is very, very important, like you have very, very nicely mentioned it. So do, again, you thank you do. very, very much, sir. I think we have helped you for a so for a very long time on the Saturday morning and uh, there is uh, a, a comment for you thanks for this master please please sir is there any role for ventricular drainage via EVD in cases with associated intraventricular hemorrhage right I think I think in TBI ventricular drainage is really important and not only with that there is interventricular hemor hemorrhage also in patients uh that, that have raised ICP, uh, for me, this is the first step of treatment, is to insert a drain. And you always get some, some, some drainage, some fluids coming out, and there's a, a, a beneficial effect on ICP, on raised ICP. So uh, in, in, in the US, in Richmond, in Virginia, Medical College, Virginia was really the first step of, uh, of treatment of raised ICP. It was to insert a, a of course, uh, you, you can also measure uh, from 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 the, the interventricular catheter. You can also measure ICP, which is the most reliable way of measuring it, uh, more than the uh, interventricular uh, ball. So this is something that we forgot often, and I think it should be done. Great, sir. Thank you thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you so much for spending uh, time on the, this morning, on Saturday, and especially because you have uh, already a family engagement. So again, I think thank you very, very much. Sir. I don't think that I, we are going to ho hold you up for so long in this question and answer discussion because I know it, uh, if we start over this topic, there will be so many things that we will come across. And uh, there's also the topic of damage control surgery that have been uh, damage control research that has been uh, already discussed in one of our previous webinars. So I think there are so much, so many things that are going on and new things that have been added up. So uh, again, thank you very, very much, sir. Thank I you, really thank wish you. to invite you. Have a nice Sunday and success for the second part of the webinar. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. So kind of you. I will play your best starting in the second webinar as well. Uh, so again, I will um, invite all the attendees to uh, use the same link to join the second webinar. And there will be two separate certificates. The certificate for this part has been already shared and the other certificate will be shared during the webinar too. So again, thank you very, very much. Sir, thank you. Thank and you. Uh, have a bye very bye. wonderful day. Bye -bye. And bye -bye. Uh, all the wishes to you and your family on this uh, very important day. And happy Father's Day again, sir. You are a teacher and you are a spiritual father for all everyone and most of the time we are mostly looking uh, to forward to your uh, amazing talks and lectures and most of the time on the, so on the spine, you. cervical you. spine lectures, all the things. So we are always very, very interested to listen to you and you, to, to read your amazing work and your publication that have been really helpful for us. So again, thank you so much. I feel uh, I, I wish to invite you again when, again for the, our master webinar series. And this one, uh, that one will be so uh, interesting for you because that will be uh, just a solo show like this one. And it, it is usually an hour long sitting and we have a lot of uh, amazing discussions and the time is usually a little late so that many of the people from all around the world join in, they come in from every part of the world. It's so, it's so interesting. Most of the time we see the attendee list because that time is quite, you know, um, quite uh, convenient for all, uh, for all parts of the world. And there's so many, so many questions and answers. And it's, it's a, that discussion you will really like. And we will really have the honor of listening to your expertise and your wonderful lectures. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice. Uh, dear attendees, I really want to uh, announce that uh, there will be the part two about um, two hours from now. So please do join uh, the part two uh, with, the, with using the same Zoom link. This, there will be a separate certificate for part two that uh, the link to download that will be shared during the webinar lecture two. And also um, uh, the access will be, get, will be given to you um, uh, after the webinar. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm now going to play our uh, previous lecture with Professor Spether. Uh, please let me know if you can see it uh, and can hear it as well. Else I will check my settings.
Robert Spessler uh, with us uh, in our webinar. This is a whole entire series on vascular neurosurgery, and we have already conducted four of webinars in vascular neurosurgery. You might have seen them. Well, most of them you have already attended these webinars. So um, again, uh, I don't think. Yeah, obviously there was a little uh, bit of change, but you can see. So again, I really I don't think that Professor Spessler needs any um, you know formal introduction, but I really wish to say a few words, and I think that we will be able to um, uh, share a few words when he's here. And the most of us use this and know quite well and use this our in our practice the Spessler model grading system for AVMs, and um, also most of you uh, who are relevant with neurosurgery and have been working do obviously know about this um, uh, there that experience of Pam Reynolds um, that's very famous very thrilling very exciting uh, like you know quite uh, spiritual so I think that I will uh, be pleased to share this with you as well so it's going to be I think a very exciting sitting uh, for all of us and i will I request you to please send your questions in the chat box and um, to please keep your uh, videos and mics muted during the webinar we will discuss all these questions in the end and uh, again thanks for joining and do join our whatsapp groups and subscribe from our website to stay updated because um, you know, we have got about four uh, very evident speakers in line for this series that include professor bandock and professor um, james gilliu professor miguel Wright, and professor lanzino who will be uh, delivering their wonderful lectures in this series Series, uh, soon and we also got two other webinars one on the women's day another one on the head injury awareness day and again the lectures are very nice and the speakers are amazing so i hope to see you uh, in all of these upcoming webinars soon as well so thanks again for joining us we will soon be starting our webinar as soon as Professor Spassler joins in. And uh, this webinar is also, um, it will be broadcast on neurosurgical.tv. Uh, Professor Spassler is here. Hello, sir. Uh, I think uh, I stopped sharing, sir. Uh, okay, sir, it's really great to have you. I think that you are muted. I let let me yeah. see if there you go. Hey, hello, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for coming today. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. No, no, sir, the pleasure and honor is all ours, sir. Thank you so much for coming today. I just can't thank you enough uh, for this huge honor and uh, obviously a matter of great joy. I was telling them that it is like a dream come true for me to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> sir, really, really, sir, it's, it's a big honor. And, you know, when we uh, start our residencies, it, we really keep talking about your grading system in our practice. It's like, um, obviously, it's just certainly a dream come true for me i just uh, uh sir i'm trying my best to uh, make sure this um uh, uh for my co-host so that you can just uh, easily share it uh yes sir sir at yes sir, i think i've just uh, uh added you as a co-host so that you can share the screen okay. sir well Welcome, sir. Thank you very, very much. I just cannot confine my happiness. I think I'm speechless today to have you with us today. Uh, let's see. Um, how do I share my screen? You, you've given me co-host, but I don't see it. Oh, here. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I see it. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir. I think, uh, sir, you can just uh, um, can, can you, uh, try your screen if you want to, your presentation. I was just showing them a few okay. slides of your introduction. But I don't think, sir, you don't need any introduction, but there are a few words I really wish to say. <laughs> Perfect, sir. I think it's loading up. 
Okay. Do you do you see it? Yes, yeah, sir. I can I can see it. We can see it and we can hear it. And if you have got videos that you wish to uh, try, you can just give it a run as well. Okay. So, are you seeing the full screen or the the smaller screen? Are sir, you seeing uh, the smaller screen? We can see the smaller screen. Okay. Let me uh, just switch that. Sir, everyone is so excited to have you. We have got a whooping number of 600 registrants for this webinar. Oh, you have got to be <laughs> kidding me. <laughs> so, no, everyone is excited. I tell you, and I, even my family is excited. I
I was telling them that uh, we are going to welcome you today. And it's like a dream come true. So I, we are all so excited. We are moving number of 600 registrants. And I think that uh, we might exceed our uh, <laughs> webinar capacity. So we've got um, it live on neurosurgical.tv as well as on my YouTube channel. So if anyone uh, who cannot join it, uh, join the Zoom channel, I really request you to join our either our YouTube channel or the neurosurgical.tv where uh, you can see it live and you can leave the questions there as well. I will be uh, keeping an eye in the YouTube channel so, as well. So I am, I am, you are seeing my small screen, the one where the arrow is. Exactly. The... Exactly. The small screen oh. on the right side, you can see the preview of your slide. Yeah. So how do I switch my screens? I'm... Uh, I think so. There is, yeah, exactly. This, this button to start it. If you press it, I think it will lead to your screen show. Uh oh. Oh, it, <laughs> it got blank. We can see you have got a total of 127 slides over here. So, sir, if you wish, you can just uh, um, use these arrow buttons because it is still no, no, quite we, large. I, I can't believe it. There's always a switch on here. Um, you know what? Let me unshare. I'm going to stop sharing, and then we'll share again. And I'll... Uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir, you can do it. Yeah. So let's do that once more. Share. And now let's, instead of this one, let's use this. Still the same thing. It's an, uh, it, sir, I think it is. Uh, if can you um, switch to the next slide, please? Uh, sir, I think it is the last one. I think it is. It is the last one now. Okay. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, sir. It, 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 I, I just can't believe it still, sir. You are here with us. So it, it, I, I, we are really overwhelmed to have you here. And uh, Professor Louis Borba has just joined in as well. Uh, uh, oh, good. <laughs> yes, exactly, sir. Everyone is, we are so, so excited. And, sir, I've been also telling them about your, you know, the uh, clinical death type of uh, the whole event of Pam Reynolds. That was very, very exciting and very, very thrilling. The story, the entire story that was covered by several documentaries including the bbc the pam reynolds huh. experience of near uh, death experience and she, the, i think uh, the one of the best ones <laughs> can, can um can you remind me how long uh i should talk uh, sir we really wish to um, uh, uh, excuse me i think uh, someone has please kindly keep your mics muted um uh, sir, I have unmuted you. Actually, I muted the other. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I got it. I got Thank it. you. Uh, sir, actually, this webinar is, uh, we have organized it only for you. It's so you are the speaker. So you are the master of this show. So uh, I think that, uh, sir, take as long as you like, because we really wish to hear you and listen to you. So most of the time, people take about an hour, but we really wish to you to talk for as long as you like. Yeah, I, an hour is a lot of time. <laughs> Nobody wants to listen more than an hour. <laughs> no, 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 sir. Not in your case. In your case, we will listen to hours and hours and hours for as, as long as we can actually do it. So, I, I, do you are you called Maria or Noor? Uh, sir, actually, both are of these are my own names. So, um, many people call me Maria, and I really like it because that's what my family also use. So, I think that um, whichever name you like, <laughs> Maria is what people use. Sir, again, thank you so much. I'm really pleased and honored to have you here with us today. And I really um, wish to share, uh, you know, <laughs> a few words that you don't need any introduction. But I think uh, uh, for, <laughs> for, you know, some um, um, like a formality, I really wish to uh, say a few words uh, for introduction, just to make everyone aware. So you have got so much of um, of contribution in neurosurgery. I don't think we could be um, anything else. Um, we could neurosurgery won't be the same without your contributions. So for everyone, sir, I think if you allow me, can we start the webinar now?
I'm, I'm ready anytime. Thank you so much, sir. So for everyone, um, it's an unbelievable, I think the most exciting webinar of what of my history which I've ever done. So I'm so excited and I think I'm speechless today and I'm a little nervous also. So Professor Robert H. Fessler, he doesn't need any uh, you know, introduction, but for formality, I want to tell you that he is the G.N. Harbour Chairman Emeritus of Neurological Surgery and Director Emeritus of the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. In 1977, he won the first award, um, his first award um, as an annual resident ever in 27th annual meeting of the Congress of Neurosurgery in 1994. He was honored as the youngest uh, um, honored guest in the Congress of Neurological Surgery. He was just 46 years old then. And in 1999, uh, he won the Herbert Oliver Crowner Award, which is considered the Nobel Prize of Neurosurgery. In 2004, he was the honored guest in the Fourth International Skull Based Congress. In 2009, he won the William B. Scoville Award. In 2010, he has this founders laurel congress of neurosurgery and he was also honored as a third scholar lecturer dr spessler has been really prolific and has published more than 300 articles and 180 book chapters as well as he um several books that he has co-edited including the Atlas, the color atlas of mitral neurosurgery and there's a very very important event during his career uh one of the most notable events during professor spessler's career include the training near death experience of pam Reynolds which she experienced during the clinical death, the deep hypothermic circulatory uh, arrest that was induced to operate her basilar artery aneurysm. You can see it. I will be sharing the links as well in our, in our WhatsApp group. So you can just go through all these videos, the documentaries that have been made. In our clinical practice, uh, all of us know him very well for the spatula margin grading for the AVMs. And I don't think that uh, um, any of you needs uh, to, me to introduce that because all of us are using it in, in our practice and i think it was the first when i joined as a resident a neurosurgeon in pakistan um, a few years ago uh it was the first question that was asked to me uh, so I, I was very excited that i knew the answer so um it was my first day <laughs> but i knew that so i was so happy so again sir thank you so much i cannot confine my um excitement today to have you it's like it really is like a dream come true for me so again thank you so much and we have exceeded our limit for our webinar the limit of our web of our attendees so i request everyone to now join our youtube channel or neurosurgical.tv to see the live webinar uh, because we have exceeded the capacity of our webinar which is blocked now so again sir uh, professor spessler thank you very much for joining us today the floor is all yours now uh, thank you, Maria, for this very, very kind introduction. Uh, it's really over the top. I hardly recognize myself. Um, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends on the other side of the world, I know it is uh, late for you, and uh, it is not very. It is just morning for me, and I am given uh, have been given the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics. If I have time, I will go uh finish and talk about management of intracranial as well as spinal avms and i thank maria for this uh, kind uh, invitation we need to recognize that avms are very dynamic lesions we see them at one point in time but here for example is a four-year-old with a uh, mr for trauma and and as we look at the scan, we really do not see anything. Maybe a little bit something up here, a little white matter. And so this, this patient uh, developed um, seizures and disorders. And 44 months later, uh, a new MRI scan was uh, performed. And now you can see an AVM deep uh, occipital lobe on the medial side that had previously just not been present. Uh, this app actually was treated with uh, embolization and gamma knife and disappeared. And 14 months later, this patient uh, was seizure free. The reverse also occurs. Here's a patient with a seizure at age twin, uh, 12 and at reasoning worsening at age uh, 37.
Let's see what happened to my. And when you look at it, it has now regressed. Uh, the angiogram has disappeared, has become negative. And so the AVM has really involuted and is no longer an active uh, lesion. This is one of the most unique cases I've seen. This is a seven-year-old, and I don't think anybody would doubt with the diagnosis that this is a cavernous malformation. That's a nice venous anomaly, has the classic pattern. They did an arteriogram, which was negative, except for the abnormal vein. And that's what we thought. It was a classic cavernous malformation. This patient was not at our institution and was treated with a gamma knife at a different institution. And this is what happened 16 months later. It had gone from what looked like a cavernous malformation to a, 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 a incredible arteriovenous malformation that looked like this. That certainly in my hands was not something that was surgically amendable and had already been treated with uh, radiation. So we need to remember that these are very dynamic lesions. They are very um, unusual lesions. They are very rare lesions. So because they're so uncommon, we really need to be able to compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges. Everybody knows uh, this AVM grading system, but actually, when I talk about AVMs, I always lump grade ones and two together because we treat them similarly, and we lump grade four and five together. So we published in 2010 a updated grading system, which we just call ABC, which is basically grade one and two in A, grade three in B, and grade four and five in C. The advantage is naturally that means you have more numbers in each group, and that gives you greater statistical validity. They have similar treatment uh, strategies and similar outcomes. And so any old study that used grade one through five can re re uh, readily be applied also to A, B, and C. So this is grade A. This is grade B. And this is great C. So when we talk about AVMs, we've got to be able to talk about the natural history. And this has been held up really pretty well, that an unruptured AVM and a seizure, one that presents with seizure, um, somewhere between two to 4%. After you've had a bleed, 6% the first, uh, the first year, and then maybe back to that, and the morbidity and mortality from a hemorrhage is 30 to 35%, and that the mortality increases with each bleed. What we do, what we have learned from Aruba is that the natural history is not benign, that at 33 months, the primary endpoint has been reached at 10% and secondary at 15%. We really can't talk about um, AVMs without considering uh, treatment options. One of them is doing nothing but to observe. When the treatment risk is greater than the benefit, we have no business operating. Then we have the classic microsurgery, we have embolization, we have radiosurgery, we have symptom control, seizures, hydrocephalus, and you have to decide which option for which patient. There are benefits, but there are also risks to stereotactic radiation. Here is one that is not an AVM, but a small meningioma, which I think in the hands of any capable neurosurgeon is an easy surgical resection. This particular neurosurgeon decided to treat this meningioma with radio surgery. And this is what happened. Radiation necrosis. The patient, unfortunately, was blind at two years 
just from the treatment with the stereotactic radiosurgery. The other problem is one of my patients, the only patient that, uh, that uh, really did not follow my recommendation. The patient presented with a seizure, rejected surgery, and had radiosurgery. She then returned two years afterward in year three with this hemorrhage and aphasia. She couldn't say no anymore. Her husband said yes, so we took it out. But she was left with a permanent deficit uh, and a partial inability uh, to speak. This is another one of my patients. This is a patient that I thought was appropriate for, radi for radio uh, radiation. It was a deep left-sided diffuse arteriovenous malformation. But this is what happened. It, the radiation necrosis became so bad, we had to do a decompressive craniotomy and she never became normal. The next question we really have to ask ourselves is how good is an MRI or an angiogram in determining whether we still have an AVM or not? 44 year old had a gamma knife in 97 for a parietal AVM. In 2000, he had an MRI negative for AVM. He was actually included in a published series of successful gamma knife treatment for AVMs. Five years after the negative AVM, he developed new refractory seizures. In 2011, now look at how far that is from uh, after the treatment. He had a bleed. On MRI cans, you could see cysts, and the angiogram was negative. So let's look at what this was. So this is a 15-year delay between gamma knife and bleed. This is what it looked like 15 years later. You can see the effect on the brain. You can see the lesion lighting up. Very simple surgical procedure, but angiogram was negative. And here we're opening, we're getting into the cyst. There is the little AVM. Maybe more like a cavernous malformation now, easily resected. And this patient ended up doing well. It's already less edema surrounding the lesion. This is a 27-year-old uh, <clears throat> with the worst headache of his life. And here I'm showing where the value of the gamma knife really comes in. You can see the CT scan. You can see the AVM. This here is the most difficult part of the AVM. Everything is in front of us. So in this particular case, what we did was we radiated this portion of the AVM. Three years later, it was a much, much easier arteriovenous malformation, and we took it out. So here, using it as a tool. So here we have a gentleman with a right thalamic AVM, a small bleed, again, had gamma knife all the way back in 89, embolization in 99, that's 10 years later, repeat gamma knife in 2000, angiogram in 2010, and the AVM was considered obliterated. I saw the patient in 2012, 13 years after the gamma knife treatment with a re-hemorrhage. And this is what it looked like. It looks like a terrible hemorrhage, but it's all intraventricular. And when you did the angiogram, you just saw this little portion of AVM with puddling sitting right in the midline. This was easily treated surgically, and now the patient is cured. My point is that an AVM, first of all, it needs routine follow-up, even when it's cured, and I'll get back to that point uh, a little bit later. Uh, but also, we better be careful about calling something cured just because we don't see it on MRI or angiography if we've treated it with just embolization or just radiation. 
Onyx, I think, was a, a, a great addition to our treatment armamentarium. And uh, I like it because you can cut it with scissors and you can resect it with an ultrasonic aspirator. But in and of itself, it has a high morbidity and mortality for treatment. In the link AVM embolization, I went to the meeting, the mortality and morbidity from embolization alone was greater than 8% with a cure rate of only 60%. Now that's a cure rate which you have to take with a grain of salt because of what I've already shown you. In 2008, the embolization risk had gone up to 14% at a slightly increased quote cure rate, 66%. And this included grade two AVMs, of which 57% of grade two AVMs went down in the rank and scale. In 2012, in, a, in the first international AVM meeting, Moray from uh, Paris, a good friend who was uh, very prominent in embolization, had his fellow review his unruptured arteriovenous malformations that he had treated. And he had a morbidity and mortality of 17% of cases of patients that had never ruptured. He stood and he admitted this and said, I no longer embolize unruptured arteriovenous malformations. Very briefly in Aruba, it was the first unruptured AVM trial. Uh, I've already mentioned that the natural history is not benign. There was lack of uniform treatment alone. 30% had embolization alone. I've just discussed the problem with embolization alone. Radiotherapy has a delayed effect. So at 33 months, that's way too early to, to see any promise from it. And why would you offer gamma knife to patients at grade one and two or A when the morbidity and mortality of microsurgical treatment is significantly lower. For Spetzler Ponzi grade A AVMs, the surgical risk was less than 1%. And that was based on Morgan series from Australia and from my own prospective uh, series. 33 months follow-up is way too short for a disease that has a morbidity mortality that is annual. It's good try, but it was a terrible study. When we talk about the technical aspects of uh, of uh, neuro of uh, AVM surgery, um, I'm very keen on the surgeon being comfortable, refining approaches, improvements in instruments. Why retractorless? I'm going to give you a case example. This is the way I like to sit. Support my arms the microscope with a mouth switch so I can move it all the time and uh, using my feet like uh, playing the organ. Having non-stick bipolars is absolutely essential. Uh, when you're in really deep holes, it's very, very nice to have extra light. Uh, these are now available from SICE and this is from Stryker. One of the one of the little pearls I love is charring is dependent on heat. When you use your bipolars, you're heating the tips. So you have the heat that affects the protein strands that coagulates the little blood vessels. By putting your uh, bipolars into ice when you're not using them, you're making them even colder, and that gives you the same effect of less charring and yet better uh, control. Light it. Uh, when you're down in a deep hole, there's a little calf mal down deep, very hard to see because your light comes in at a different angle from your optical axis. So adding on light at uh, bipolar really makes it a lot nicer. We are so used to putting retractors into the brain that we do it without really considering whether we need to or not. I like to do what is called dyna oh, dynamic retraction. 
Uh, let me just go back one. Which is basically not doing this, but instead <clears throat> using your fingers, your instruments, so that you're constantly moving the opening to wherever you're working. And if you think that tension doesn't affect blood flow, this is tiny tension on the dentate ligament. And look at just by lifting up, you are affecting the blood flow. <clears throat> as soon as you release it, the blood flow returns to normal. Image guidance has made a very big difference in my own care of uh, patients with AVMs. Here's an example. AVM down here, the easiest approach is really to go through the occipital parietal lobule. And by using image guidance, you can go through the occipital parietal lobule. You can see a little effect of the small subarachnoid hemorrhage. Without image guidance, you would be making a much bigger, bigger opening. And here you're right there and you can take the lesion out. Not very difficult. We'll see the uh, falks here in a second. Now there's the falks, the white of the falks. A very nice approach made possible with image guidance. ICG. ICG is nice because it's quick, safe, inexpensive, has high resolution, but you can only see what you see through the microscope. You don't see the deep. Um, but for its purpose of seeing if there's anything left, and then later on in spinal AVMs, it really makes a very, very nice uh, uh, difference. And so now we can see post-op, we see no longer any abnormal filling. You can also orient yourself. So here we have the an AVM, ICG. And as we follow this along, we can see where these veins are. We can correlate them to the actual surgical exposure. And that makes it easier to know where your anatomy is. And then we take it out. But it really does help you localize and orient your angiographic picture uh, with your surgical picture. So ICG for IVMs, I think it has a value. It's important to recognize its limitation. It does not show deep circulation. Uh, we still require intraoperative angiogram for definitive answer, and but it does complement the DSA. The beauty is you could use it over and over and over again. Special considerations. Here's a 23-month-old female infant, has progressive neurological decline and heart failure. This is obviously a grade C, 950 cc's total blood volume. But this patient is just going downhill. You notice only AVM fills, none of the normal circulation. The steel is phenomenal, which is why there's progressive neurological deficit. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Albuquerque, did a beautiful job of um, embolizing. But even with embolization, you just see a, a little bit of other vessels filling that weren't filling before. So we exposed it. Um, um, parents were fully aware of the high risk. In a 23 months old, not only is the blood volume very small, but the vessels are also very, very ginger. There are They are very very fragile and so i'm going around the edge and here i have some bleeding and i'm thinking to myself very very small blood volume and i'm thinking to myself why did i become a neurosurgeon the secret however is to not give up when it's bleeding you've got to work where the problem is and finally we get it under control don't just cover it up and go somewhere else. Get it under control. Here you see some of the coils from previously. And then I just keep going around the lesion and around the lesion with these non-stick bipolars until I don't see any more filling. 
with the ICG, and then we got an intraoperative angi angiogram. And now it's dead. Here is the intraoperative angiogram, the first one, the second one. And here's three months follow up. You can see the big vessels that were there initially all have disappeared. And you've got beautiful filling of the normal brain. And uh, with permission, this is her. Another special consideration this is an 18 week old with a brewery. Here you have special considerations. How do you eliminate radiation like CT scans, angiography, et cetera? So we used only the MRI scan in this treatment paradigm. And here's a large uh, uh, venous aneurysm associated with the small ABM that's underneath. You can see it here. And we take it out. And then the pole stop. I also want to point out that when we analyze AVMs, some of them look terrible, but they're really not that bad. This is a 32 year old. She's had two hemorrhages. And here, when you're looking at this AVM, um, um, it, 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 it looks pretty awesome. When you do the angiogram, however, all you see is drainage in this direction. So at surgery, all you really need is an inner hemispheric approach because it's all being fed from the anterior spine, I mean, from the anterior uh, uh, artery. So by A3s, all we have to do is go along the artery and eliminate all the feeders and then take the ABM out. I'm not gonna show you this video for time, sake but that's what looks like a bad avm but in fact this is a relatively easy one special considerations in children we've already talked about recurrence with uh, embolization and with um, radiation alone with children the follow-up uh, has to be very, very strict. So if you have a diffuse AVM like this one here, and you take it out, I left a clip behind because I was suspicious I might have to come back again, but you can see the post-op angiogram really is, is it's absolutely perfect, 213, 217, a little bit over three year follow up. 16 years old now, and you see the avium has come back with a vengeance, absolute vengeance. So here we go. This is a patient uh, from one of the Arab uh, countries that uh, the father was a triple A personality and so worried about his child, uh, a lot of pressure. But here we'd already had previous uh, uh, surgery so and previous hemorrhage. So we really had a very relatively easy field to operate in. This is all pretty much necrotic brain. And so we just keep going around the AVM, no retractor in place. We just use our sucker and our bipolar and you have to keep going to be sure that you get it all. It's very easy in this diffuse AVMs to cut across the AVM in a portion and leave behind residual, which will just get uh, back to you. So it was complete resection. That's it. And then she had a five-year follow-up after this, and the angiogram was negative, and now she's an adult, and the risk is uh, incredibly small. Another special consideration. Eight-year-old was found unresponsive in 207, has this small thalamic ABM, but it looks right by the internal capsule. I recommended actually uh, radiation, um, but the uh, family uh, did not follow three. Patient came back, had another hemorrhage at age nine and another one at age 13. And here's the dream. 
And look how this AVM has changed. It is now a very formidable uh, AVM. We thought maybe that the culprit was a little aneurysm. And Dr. McDougall embolized this aneurysm. And we thought that that reduced the risk enough because I did not think that we could remove this AVM and keep the patient intact. He had a weakness already. <laughs> so this was the difference, 2007 to 2012. So he canceled surgery, but he rebled a few weeks later, and he was scheduled for surgery. Patient and mother, she was his caretaker, were aware that the patient would be hemiplegic if we took this out surgically. There is the surgery. I won't bore you with it. It was actually much easier than I anticipated because of the previous hemorrhages. There were nice cavities. And so it was bipolar cut, bipolar cut, bipolar cut until it was all out. Here's the post up, ABM negative, and there was no change in this exam. I don't understand where the internal capsule is. Uh, maybe it had already been moved over to the other side, but at any rate, his exam was unchanged. So it, it, it taught me that just because anatomically I would have expected a deficit doesn't mean we, have, we really have one. Um, this is an easy AVM. The reason I include it is because this is a vessel on passage. When you look at the angiogram, you see artery coming in and artery coming out. So embolizing this would be relatively easy, but embolizing risks the vessel on passage. And it's an AVM that does not require embolization. So here we are at the time of surgery. We're going down. This is the feeding artery, which we temporarily occlude. That's the middle cerebral artery branch. And then we cut and we bipolar every branch that we see going directly to the arterial venous malformation. Again, notice no retractors in place. And we go distally and we identi identify the vessels on passage, like over here and over here. So we just keep surrounding the arterial venous malformation, separating it from the white matter. And the bottom naturally is always the most fragile and most difficult. But you see this dynamic retraction just, just between the scissors and the sucker or the bipolar and the sucker. And that's really all I need. And then we take it out. We take off the temporary clip. And you can see on the ICG that all the vessels on Passage are filling. So that meant the patient had absolutely no neurologic deficit. You could still see the artery that was feeding the AVM now going to the vessels on Passage uh, as not completely uh, gotten smaller. Special consideration. This is a the, the daughter of a professor with this dominant hemispheric AVM in the midline. The question is, how do you reach this? So I personally like the inner hemispheric approach with the head being horizontal at 45 degrees. It gives you the opportunity to work with your eyes, which are horizontal, your hands, which are horizontal, and you can use gravity to retract the ipsilateral hemisphere. This one, there wasn't much embolized because there weren't any big theaters. And so this is what it looked like. Which guidance here is because we're going to come from the opposite side. So we're looking at the faults with the AVM behind it. And so by with inch guidance, well, we can open the faults a little bit uh, higher uh, in a safe manner. I love going across the midline with my openings then pulling the door over, and that allows you to pull over the central sinus just a little bit. Here we're opening the fault, leaving it attached really, and you can see all the vascularity. 
And this is the middle line. The big problem actually is all the way over there. The left most lateral portion, the AVM. So we just keep going. Here we do need a retractor to hold up the brain. And then we get all the way across. This is the most difficult portion, actually. And now we're back to the midline. And here we have the draining vein, which we now take and take the ABM out. And that's her post stop. And she remained an A student. Appropriate approach. Here's one more example of this. This is a uh, patient with this ABM. The most difficult portion will be right here. So we're going ipsilateral first to separate it from the falks. So I'm going to put some gel foam in on the ipsilateral side between the falks and the AVM. Then I'm going to go to the contralateral side. And then with image guidance, I'm going to open the falks. Gel foam is sitting right there. And that gives me a good angle to get to the AVM. And then I just go along the edge of the AVM. Now I'm looking way across the other side. I'm in a very comfortable position. And here we're looking all the way to the most lateral portion of the AVM, which we can then uh, remove. And then we pull it out. But you can see what you can accomplish without a retractor, even though you're going all the way over there. And the reason you can do that is because of the approach. So the appropriate approach is really key. When we... Uh, a temporal AVM. When we look at uh, grade four, like this here, I'm just gonna go quicker on that. You can appreciate it. My point here is, You go and you stay in control, no matter where you are. If it starts to bleed, don't cover it up. Most of the time, it is because the AVM has, has you've cut across part of the AVM. So you just keep going laterally on the AVM. And you can see how, how the ICG is really helpful. It shows you where it's still bleeding. Now I'm going down on the middle side. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but here it comes out. And just because it's large doesn't mean that you use any different technique. And there's the pulse stop, tolerated it well. So what do we do? What is also important is not unusual that when you have an AVM in a, in a uh, critical portion of the brain, that the patient temporarily gets worse, but then gets better with time. The question is not, can you, but the question is really, should you? And here's one of my favorite studies we published in 03. So for uh, 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 a two-year period, Dr. Hahn, who was the chief resident at the time, we, we, uh, we receive a lot of grade four and five AVMs. And so at rounds, we decide on treatment. So he did a prospective study for two years and these were our recommendations for the grade four and five patients or grade C, 80% we recommended no treatment. In 15%, we recommended partial treatment, embolization, aneurysm clipping. In only 5% did we uh, recommend complete obliteration. So, we were being criticized because our results of grade four and five AVMs were uh, remarkably good, even though it was very close to 20% morbid mortality. 
the bottom line is that the selection process where you're only taking one out of 20 patients gives you an incredible edge. So it's the selection process. And so our in the most important uh, decision remains grade one and grade two, we recommend surgical uh, resection for grade three or B, we recommend whatever is appropriate. And for grade four and five, multimodality treatment only if repetitive or significant hemorrhage or progressive neurological uh, disability. Um, I have 15 minutes, so I will talk uh, briefly about one of my very, very favorite topics, uh, spinal arterial venous lesions, because they're so misunderstood. Unfortunately, they are so uncommon um, that uh, very few neurosurgeons really have a great interest in them. There are fistula, there are, there's the dorsal fistula, the most common, and there's ventral fistula and the extradural fistula, which is now being treated exclusively by endovascular surgeons. There are AVMs, the uh, uh, metameric, the juvenile, the one that doesn't respect any anatomy. There's intramedullary AVM in the midline, there's intramedullary AVM lateral, and there's the conus AVM. There are two types of intradural AVMs, uh, the, the dorsal and the ventral. And the dorsal one is the one that presents with venous hypertension, progressive myelopathy, and uh, many, many times for a long period, at, it had been considered that, the, that there was a lesion that was right outside the dura. It is not. I'm sorry if I'm going a little fast, but I want to do, do get through this. Here is the classic MRI picture, the angiogram, very, very, very slow flow as these veins fill. When you look inside the dura, you see the feeding vessel. When you look outside the dura by the nerve root, you see all these vessels, which had been considered to be the problem. And then naturally you have these coiled vessels. If you cut the portion out inside the dura, right next to the dura, you can see the vessel going from artery to vein. It's a direct arteriovenous fistula. And so here's an example, progressive paraparesis. This is one that has, which I call type B, because there's more than one feeder. This is what it looks like. You can see why you would consider that this might be the problem. When you inject lower down, it's also feeding here. But if you look closely, this point and this point are the same. This is nothing more than an artery to artery recruitment to the fistula. So I've turned the operative picture in the same direction. So here it is. This is where it goes from artery to vein, artery to vein. Um, so, Here's an example of a foramen magnum lesion like this, just to demonstrate the myelopathic component. Patient was in a wheelchair, and if you looked at the MRI scan, you can see why. You can also see arteries already way filled and just the, AV, the fistula slowly filling. Dr. McDougall was not able to treat this endovascularly, so we did it at surgery. Here you're looking, vertebral artery, is coming in right over here. This is fistula. These are all recruitment vessels. The secret, that's um, um, vertebral artery down below. This is pica. All you have to do is identify the fistula, which is not always easy. Here's the post-op. Fistula is gone. This is what it looked like pre-op. This is one year later. Patient is walking independently. Ventral, they're very uncommon. Uh, we've kept um, Merlant's designation of small, medium, and large. And this was really discovered by Roberto Heroes. Here is one example of mine, 15-year-old. She has this little lesion. We went transthoracic into the spinal cord. Here it is, fistula, artery of Adamkowitz coming up, anterior spinal artery. This is the fistula anterior vein, 
Very easy to take out after we got good exposure. Here it's gone. Here the fistula is gone. And she did very well. They can be incredibly large, like this one, anterior spinal artery. All I needed to do is find the connection. This is the anterior spinal artery feeding the fistula. Here's continuation. One little clip right across there. And you went from this to this to a negative angiogram. Extra intradural, these are very rare lesions, fortunately. And these used to be called juvenile, metameric, or type 3. Uh, they can present anyway. Here is uh, just one example. This one is uh, presenting on a 12-year-old. It's relatively small, but it's compressing the spinal cord. You can see the spinal cord markedly compressed. Here is the angiogram. Uh, this is uh, lateral. This is after embolization. And this is at the time of surgery. Here's the open dura, you can see part of the ABM that's intradural. The rest is covered up by uh, extradural tissue. And then my whole goal was really to decompress, identify this nerve root, and try to preserve it. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to push every movement I make is toward the bone, away from the compressed spinal cord. And so you can just see how I'm going around this arterial venous mal malformation. Nerve root is going out here. Nerve root is starting here. I didn't think I was going to be able to preserve the nerve root, but as it turned out, uh, I was fortunate and was able to do that. And here's the intradural component. Here's pre-op. Here's post-op. You can see the market decompression of the spinal cord and post-op, angiogram negative. The last uh, identity for the intramedullary ones is a conus. It's one that we defined in 2002, and it's unique because of the angioarchitecture at the conus. You have the posterior spinal arteries and you have the anterior spinal arteries and there you have a basket that connects those arteries uh, this is always uh, located anatomically specifically at the conus i'll get, show you one example this is a professor uh, from texas presented with a subarachnoid hemorrhage they didn't uh, realize where the subarachnoid hemorrhage was coming from. Intracranial workup was negative. This is what the MRI scan showed when they looked at the spine. Intact. There's the angiogram. And you have many, many other vessels that feed this. And here it is working between the nerve roots. Using the lighted sucker just to, to give you a little more illumination the non-stick bipolars, and we end up taking the lesion out. Obviously, you have to be very careful to preserve the normal anatomy. So this immediate post-op angiogram, full strength. She had mild lower sacral nerve root anesthesia, uh, urinary retention, straight cath. She was discharged home on post-operative day four. She returned six weeks later. Her urinary symptoms resolved, anesthesia improving. And a follow-up DSA showed no residual. So conclusions for conus AVMs, they're a distinct entity because they can present with myelopathy or radiculopathy, with compression or with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, um, embolization and uh, surgery uh, give you a very nice result. And and all ambulatory patients remained ambulatory, and 75% of those that were non-ambulatory became ambulatory. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I left out the other ones. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry. I, I somehow uh, missed the intramedullary lesions. Then maybe I'll talk to you some other time about this. But the conclusion is really that... Uh, these lesions are, are um, difficult, but when treated appropriately, 
uh, you can really have satisfying results with a very um, grateful patient. I thank you all for your attention, and I'm sorry it's so late at night over there. Thank you so much, sir. The honor and pleasure is all ours, and we are all so excited. It isn't late for us, and we could listen to you for hours and hours. And, uh, sir, I think that uh, all of us really wish to request you to deliver a lecture now on the spinal malformation. So, sir, whenever it is convenient for you. Okay. So I really wish I will send you an email and I will request you again to deliver these lectures because I think everyone is so excited to listen to that uh, lecture as well. And I indeed, I really wish to, I personally want to request you that if you can start a, a series with us, I think that we will be more than blessed and we will be really lucky to have you for our series if you have some time, if it is convenient for you. So whenever, at which any time and any day which is convenient for you, we will be really pleased to have you. We are really excited and we are overwhelmed to have you here. Okay. I will send you this email. I will request you again. So again, so thank you so much. I don't think that I've got words to show you how uh, much deeply grateful I am and honored and how much uh, deeply grateful everyone is right now because I'm receiving so many messages in the chat box and everyone is uh, sending you greetings and regards and thank yous. So again, sir, it's, it's really, it's a big honor for us to have you here and we are really happy and i think that we really wish to listen to you again and we exceeded our zoom limit as well so i requested everyone i diverted everyone towards the youtube channel because everyone really wanted to listen to you so again thank you so much uh sir i think um the, uh, i really wish to um uh, you know highlight a couple of uh, questions over here if you have some time can i can sure. i add a few questions Sir, uh, uh, one question is, uh, sir, regarding this, uh, you know, arterial venous malformation, it was not, they were not considered as a congenitor, they were considered as a developmental anomaly, but later on it was discovered that they may arise uh, later in life, and also there was a two-hit phenomenon where they said there is some genetic predisposition that leads to uh, the formation of avians later in life. So, sir, what's your kind view regarding this and how this affects the origin of these avians can affect the course of the disease, and can this affect fact, the management uh, strategy uh, according to their origin in the avians? I, I don't think there's any doubt at all that these are developmental lesions. They don't, they, first you have the rare familial ones uh, that don't happen very often, but there is no doubt that they develop through life. They, that there are so many examples of negative angiogram, negative MRI scan, and then the development of an arteriovenous malformation. And uh, I think that's really why in children specifically, you have to be so careful with follow-up when you take one out because the risk of recurrence or the risk of developing an adjacent one uh, is very significant. Exactly. So uh, thank you so much for this. So there's another thing that most of the time we have this uh, aneurysm first focus uh, where we uh, really wish to treat that aneurysm because obviously it's a very high risk one. But in uh, literature, they have defined that sometimes the flow related aneurysm, they regress after the treatment of the avian. So some uh, uh, neurosurgeons have shared that if the aneurysm is small or high risk, then you might treat the uh, avian and the aneurysm, which is if unruptured, say, so it will regress on its own. It sounds quite risky since aneurysms associated with the AVMs, they are very, very risky. So do you think that this is, uh, uh, what do you think that, is it possible that like many people say, if it is a small aneurysm, if you treat the floor, uh, I mean the flow, um, uh, fluorated aneurysm to say that if it is a small one, you might uh, treat the AVM one uh, first and then think about the aneurysm or just leave it if it's just a small one. So it's a clinical dilemma. I really wish you to share your view on it. Uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's a very important uh, topic. And I think First, we have to recognize that aneurysms are flow-related problems. So um, they, they occur in places where there's a weakness and where there's a lot of flow and stress. So there's no doubt that uh, aneurysms associated with AVMs, in my mind, are of two varieties. One is the one uh, that is large, that is, has a small neck, and is at high risk. 
And then there are the ones that tend to be more shallow, where they're, where, where they're um, more of a dilatation of the feeding vessel. Um, and so I look at it, um, if, if you can get rid of the AVM and you have some shallow, small aneurysms that are on proximal vessels that are not within reach of your surgical exposure, uh, then you can follow them to see if they disappear. Um, otherwise, when you look at the risk of an aneurysm bleeding and the risk of an AVM bleeding, the aneurysm risk is much, much, much higher. So you're talking about a 50% morbidity and mortality as opposed to a 30% morbidity and mortality. I mean, half half the patients with a subarachnoid hemorrhage die. So from an aneurysm. So I I I would never ignore an aneurysm associated with an AVM. Perfect. I've just seen that someone else, Dr. Sajjad Muhammad, has also asked the, the question about the management of fluorated aneurysm. So you have very nicely uh, elaborated uh, this. Uh, this question. Thank you so much. Sir, there's another entity, which is rather um, um, not quite uh, much discussed, but sir, uh, in cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage, we always have this vasospasm in our mind, but not in the cases of AVM. So obviously, uh, there is a difference, obviously, in the in, in case of aneurysm, there is blood directly coming into the subarachnoid space and at a higher rate. But sir, there are a few uh, reports in, in the literature where they have actually described vasospasm associated with AVM rupture. Sir, so what's your kind view in that case uh, regarding this vasus present is not quite well defined in the case of AVM. So obviously um, the whole thing is quite different in the case of AVM, but can there be a possibility of vasus present um, delayed cerebral ischemia in cases of AVM rupture? Yeah, I, I think when you see a lot of vasospasm with an AVM um, and without a big hematoma, the most likely culprit is really an aneurysm that's associated with the AVM that has bled. AVM, AVMs tend not to bleed with ferocity into the subarachnoid space, but rather into the ventricles or create a big hematoma, whereas aneurysms bleed into the subarachnoid space and heavily envelop the blood vessels with blood. And that is the result why we have such uh, a difference in the incidence of vasospasm between those two entities. Great. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Nikolai Siermoris has asked a question on the natural history of spinal avians. Uh, sir, is there any study for the natural history of the spinal avians and your kind opinion for this issue, please? I think, sir, we really wish, really need to have a, an, another sitting with you regarding spinal avians now. <laughs> yeah. yeah you know, spin, spinal avians are just such fascinating, fascinating lesions. And because they are so uncommon, we do not have very good natural history data. We have the best data for the dorsal fistula. And we know with the dorsal fistula that uh, if you don't treat it, that patient will, uh, with a high degree of certainty, end up in a wheelchair. So the most important lesion in the spinal vascular lesions is really the dorsal fistula. and my own my own preference is to cut out the fistula as opposed to embolizing it because you have to get it to the fistulous point not proximal to where where all those uh, recruiting vessels are located on the nerve root Great. Amazing, sir. Sir, um, in my, uh, like, I'm very quite junior, but I've seen just one patient of spinal avium. So I think that we really need to uh, know more about it. So there are also um, more, there was another case that I actually, um, you know, shared in the link conference, uh, like you have said, with Professor Jacques Moray and Professor Lawrence Bell. So it was of a dural AV fistula after trauma. And that patient presented to us so many years after a very minor head injury and it was like he he never knew he was presented to the ENT with the tinnitus and the ENT one referred him to a psychiatrist because he thought that he's having some psychological issues or some sort of a post-traumatic stress disorder and 
later on it was discovered that he was having the dural AV fistula as a post traumatic inner origin. And so he had a very minor head injury. It was very, very fascinating for us because it was so totally un, um, uh, unexpected. And it was the first time we saw that case of a, of a traumatic dural AVF, but we referred him uh, to the endovascular suite for treatment. We did not operate him. So I think that's a, a, what first was review about this traumatic type of AV fistula. Yeah, I, there's no doubt that trauma is uh, or surgery is one of the causes of fistulas. Uh, Dr. Dan Barrow from the Emory uh, reported a beautiful case of a dural fistula uh, in the spine. And, and it was a patient that had an angiogram previously uh, for some reason or other, which showed a perfectly normal angiogram. And then... Um, Two or three years later, the, the patient presented with progressive myelopathy, and so it was given uh, and had a, a, a surgical procedure for a disc removal at that level, and then uh, demonstrated a fistula. So these cases occur. Uh, it's part of the fascination of medicine. That's great, sir. I think that everyone needs to have a lot. your mics and video. Please to give a brief introduction. Professor Michael Lawton uh, is the president and CEO of Barrow Neurological Institute and the chair of the Department of Neurological Surgery. Uh, his expertise includes cerebrovascular diseases, of course, and skull-based tumors. He has experience in treating more than 5,200 brain aneurysms, 990 AVMs, and about 1,000 cavernous malformations, including 300 in the brain stem and other delicate areas. We know him for his uh, Lot and Young um, supplementary grading system. I think it was the one of the earliest questions I've been asked when I started my own residency. So I know we had a case of AVM and they asked me this question. I, I, I was so happy that I knew it uh, back then. So it was um, like it's so much important clinically that we use it each day. Uh, but Professor Michael Lawton has also proposed this uh, grading system for the brainstem cavernous malformations. I have shared all these links on my WhatsApp group and on my Facebook, uh, so you can just go through them if you want to read the whole article. I think many of us already know it who are clinically practicing, so uh, most of us uh, are already using them as to just having a lot of good experience in um, knowing our own cases. So uh, the vital and Lawton grading this supplementary is very uh, much uh, famous already, but the brainstem cavernoma is a real, it's a new one. So we all know about it, but we are just uh, going th through it, um, reading it. I've shared this link for with all of you. Uh, these are some of the very important papers. And we also know him for his seven series, the triology that has already been published. And indeed, it equates to the seven wonders uh, of neurological surgery. The seven cavernomas is a compilation of articles that have been published by the JNS, and I have also shared the link um, to, to that uh, compilation. You can find it. I will also share it again uh, in the chat box so that you can uh, find it if you um, haven't yet seen them. So it is um, something very important. Also, many of you might have seen uh, his uh, seven series videos on the BNI website, and these are really important for us, especially the young neurosurgeons who are just learning. And I think it's for the senior ones as well to have a very good insight uh, because Mm, we know you cannot be um, he's a master and uh, some of sometimes we wonder how someone can operate that nicely in those precarious areas so it's um it's uh, like when we invited you sir i was so overwhelmed and i told my colleagues about you so again thank you so much for coming today um, um it's, it's a matter of real honor and i think that uh, there is no description that describes what you have been doing for neurosurgery not only for the patient but also for the trainees on and everyone who is around the world and all 
of your teachings is going to translate into a much better and improved healthcare. And um, we will uh, be having the privilege of inviting Professor Spessler Lachan next um, uh, in uh, on 19 February. So again, I really want to invite everyone who is here to please join us on 19 February to attend this lecture. Uh, Professor Lachan, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming, for accepting our invitation today. Uh, we are really honored and pleased to have you and we are obliged that you accepted our invitation even while, uh, during your very busy schedule and even it's quite early in um, your part of the world sir welcome and the floor is all yours now great thank you so much um i'd like to share my screen can you um enable that for me uh, sure sir i i just uh, see uh, if there is the... oh, oh okay sorry uh, 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 sir, can you share your screen now? Let's try now. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Thank um, you so much. So, yeah, so um, you should see in just a second my title slide. Can you see that? Uh, perfectly, sir. Sorry? Perfectly, sir. We can see. Oh, okay, great. Perfectly. Great. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Nora. Um, I appreciate the invitation and um, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, just to be clear, um, what do we have? We have um, an hour? Exactly. We do have an hour, but you can take as long as you like because uh, uh, this is uh, all solely your own show. So you can take okay. as long as you like. Okay. I have to be finished at uh, 7 o'clock my time. Uh, because I have another meeting to go to, but um, so I'll I'll go ahead and get going. Um, so what I thought I would talk about is um, brainstem cavernous malformations, and as um, as mentioned, I've been um, focused on these over the last um, two years, just trying to put my next book together, which uh, we're almost done with. Um, the uh, the book is on um, cavernous malformations throughout the brain, and it's coming out as a collection in. Uh, JNS and you know the goals for the book were to um, like for some of the others develop a, a taxonomy for cavernous malformations um, talk about tissue sparing approaches to get there and then um, overall just uh, to improve the uh, clinical diagnosis and decision making that goes into the management so um, that was the uh, the goal of the uh, the book um, and uh, it will come out uh, once we finish the last of the journal papers. Um, so these are some of the numbers um, at last tally, um, a lot of cases. So, um, you know, I, I always I feel blessed. I, I feel the need to take my experience and um, convert that into lessons um, for others to uh, to learn from, because it's um, not everybody who gets to, to do these kinds of numbers. And that's um, partly what motivates me. This is the outline for the talk. We'll, get through as much of this as we can uh, in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, so let's get started. The first is patient selection. Um, it's always hard to, to pick these because, um, you know, doing surgery on the brainstem can be um, very uh, morbid for, for patients if, pa if you don't select the right ones. And so one of the early uh, goals was to try and find a grading system for these patients that does that didn't exist. And so we put this together as one of the first papers um, um, in this whole effort. And um, when we looked at our experience and our statistics, we found that there were five variables that mattered. There was, there was um, size, crossing the axial midpoint, uh, the presence of a DVA, age and hemorrhage. And um, these were the, the ones that kind of came out of the statistical analysis. And we did, a grading system that was not unlike the Spencer Martin or supplementary grading, where you look at these factors, you assign these cut points, and then give um, uh, points based upon um, the criteria. And you'll notice a couple of things. First, um, age has a cut point that's at 40, um, and it's a zero or two, unlike um, the um, uh, AVM grading system that has uh, three tiers. With hemorrhage, we have three tiers with zero, one, and two for acute, subacute, and chronic hemorrhage. And um, 
you know, the, the, the way I remember all of these different variables is, is it's not unlike ABM grading, where you have a size, an eloquence variable, which here we refer to as crossing the axial mid midpoint. And venous drainage is kind of like the presence of the DVA. So you can remember the first three, like Spetzler Martin grading, and you can remember the last two, like um, supplementary grading, where you have an age variable and you have um, uh, a bleeding variable, uh, except that it's timing rather than yes, no. So anyway, um, this is how the, uh, the brainstem grading system is put together. And when you look at numbers, um, at least in that initial series, um, they were quite small in these lower uh, or high grade uh, patients. And so uh, one of the first things we did in the series was to validate the grading system in my patients that came afterwards, plus Dr. Spetzler's page, patients. And um, what we found, um, you can see the different approaches here. We found um, a lot of similarity between the ways that uh, he and I operate, uh, which was uh, no surprise. We saw a good distribution of the uh, cavernous malformations be great. And um, what we found was that they kind of distribute themselves into low, intermediate, and high grade, low being 0, 1, 2, intermediate being 3, 4, and 5, and high grade being 6 and 7. And there was this nice linear drop-off um, that correlated outcome with grade, which is exactly what you want a grading system to do. And it was true when you looked at both um, outcomes in terms of absolute outcomes, good and poor, um, or in terms of relative outcomes, whether the patients were worse or um, unchanged or better. And, and so um, the, the takeaway is that, um, you know, when you have um, um, high grade AVM patients, the, uh, uh, the sixes and the sevens, these are the ones to be careful of because you can see from these graphs, the, the risks go way up when you get into those, um, in those ranges. So um, you can use the brainstem cavernous malformation grading scale as a way to select your patients. And um, when they're lower intermediate grade, I think it's um, uh, fair game and safe to offer surgery. Uh, when you get into the high grade uh, patients, you need to be a little bit more cautious or not operate at all. Now, um, one of the most important things I think from this effort is this taxonomy. And so um, I've kind of, um, uh, I've, I've put these um, uh, taxon this tax taxonomy together in terms of types and subtypes with um, type referring to location in the midbrain pons and medulla and subtype referring to the location where the lesion surfaces, whether it's anterior, posterior, et cetera. Um, and so that's the way to think about the taxonomy. Uh, the data comes from my patients and Dr. Spetzler's patients, and we put these together in one database. And then um, this sort of summarizes how it works. If you look at the midbrain, uh, you see five different types. You've got interpeduncular and peduncular in blue and red. You've got a lateral um, tegmental uh, zone here. You have a posterior one, and you've got a periaqueductal subtype. So the, these are the five subtypes within the midbrain. As we go to the pons, um, you see the color coding is the same. We have an anterior uh, um, subtype here that's called the basilar uh, subtype. You've got a peritrigeminal one here in red. We've got a middle peduncular here in orange, inferior peduncular in green, and a rhomboid uh, one here in blue. And if you look in this central zone here, this yellow, uh, this is the super olivary subtype, which um, uh, comes into the central pons from below, which is a very uh, sneaky way to get into the central pons from a far lateral approach, which we'll talk about later. Moving on to the medulla, you can see uh, we've got the pyramidal, the olivary, the cuneate, the gracile, and then down here in the ventricle, we've got the trigonal, which is the lower part of the floor of the fourth ventricle. So those are the zones. There are 16 uh, subtypes. You can uh, see this table here. If you remember the various names of the, um, the subtypes, you'll, you'll remember the zones because they're very anatomically described um, and they'll lead you right to the correct name. And the whole key to the taxonomy is just learning these names, learning the anatomy that defines the, 
the different uh, territories, and then doing a correct categorization. This is just another view. Um, this just shows you the midbrain ponds and medulla. You can see this is the anterior view, so we see nicely the interpeduncular, the basilar, and the pyramidal uh, subtypes. As we go into the red zones, you can see peduncular, um, you can see the um, uh, peritrigeminal here in the ponds, and you can see olivary down here. As we uh, go around more laterally, uh, you start to see the orange territory of the tegmental, middle peduncular, and cuneate zones. And then um, on this next slide, we're going around to the back where you can see quadrigeminal, you can see the floor of the fourth ventricle, the rhomboid and the trigonals. And, uh, and then lastly, the green zones, the gracile, the inferior peduncular, and periaqueductal up at the top. So um, um, that's the taxonomy. Uh, one other thing we wanted to introduce was this notion of giant cavernomas. Uh, we have a giant definition for aneurysms, for uh, AVMs, for pituitary lesions, um, but not for cavernomas. And so we, we threw this one out there. Um, we looked at the relative risks of a functional decline. And um, we found that as the size grew from two and a half centimeters all the way up to four, the greatest um, change in outcome was after three. You can see this jump here. And, and so we decided that um, this was a good cut point for the, the definition of giant. And so we, we, we view anything that's three centimeters or greater as a giant lesion. And uh, that's what we recommend as the um, kind of the, uh, the cutoff for the definition. The graph here just shows you that unlike a lot of lesions, tumors, for example, or aneurysms, the size of a cavernous malformation is dynamic. Uh, it generally is increasing, but sometimes it can decrease um, as the blood gets reabsorbed. Uh, sometimes it can jump up quite dramatically with a, with a hemorrhage and so forth. So you, you have to always sort of reassess the size uh, of the lesion. Now, um, one of the things that um, the taxonomy tells you is, um, is what clinical constellation or syndrome you can expect with these patients. The anatomy of the brainstem is so loaded that lesions in specific areas um, will tell you exactly what subtype you're dealing with. Um, it, it's not unlike what um, we learned from the stroke syndromes um, many, many uh, decades ago by our um, astute neurologist. The, the symptoms from a stroke would tell you exactly what part of the brainstem the stroke was in. Well, the same is true with um, cavernous malformations. You can see if you look at the subtypes according to their, um, their different uh, symptomatology, each one of these columns has a different heat map, a different pattern of green and red. And so there, there is this uh, constellation of symptoms that really matches the syndrome here. And so you can really um, come to your diagnosis of the malformation just by having a really good neurological bedside exam and recognizing the, uh, the syndrome and pairing that with the, uh, with the subtype. So I'll show you some examples. The interpeduncular uh, lesion is shown here. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the Claude syndrome. And uh, you can see how um, a lesion in the interpeduncular fossa affects the red nucleus and the third nerve. So you have a contralateral cerebellar ataxia and an ipsilateral ocular motor nerve palsy. And the presence of those symptoms will lead you right to this localization of the cavernous malformation. Uh, if we go on to the peduncular lesion, uh, this is your uh, classic um, Weber syndrome. And so you, instead of the um, uh, um, ataxia, this is more, uh, in the uh, the peduncle, and so you have a contralateral hemiparesis or hemiplegia with your third nerve palsy, and that localizes or identifies the uh, peduncular subtype rather than the interpeduncular subtype. As we go around to the tegmentum, uh, for some of these, we just didn't find an equivalent or pre-existing uh, stroke syndrome, so we, we have to define our own. This is what we call a lemniscal syndrome uh, because it impacts the uh, trigeminal, the medial, and lateral lemnisci in this tegmental zone of the posterolateral midbrain. 
Uh, you can see how it um, affects those tracts. It will cause facial numbness. It will cause pain and temperature disruption, and it will affect uh, vibration and fine touch. So it, it really hits those three uh, tracts. And in addition, uh, the spinal thalamic tract, which is your pain and temperature tract, which is uh, sitting right here next to the medial lemniscus. Moving around to the quadrigeminal plate, we all know paranoid syndrome with um, paresis of up gaze, light near dissociation. And this comes from these lesions back here, right around the posterior commissure and um, superior colliculi and affecting the, uh, the nerve nuclei here. Um, periaqueductal lesions can cause a Nothnagel syndrome, uh, and um, it's very much like the Claude syndrome, but, but usually a little lower down, uh, depending on where you are relative to the decusation of the uh, superior cerebellar peduncle. That will um, determine whether your ataxia is ipsy or contralateral, and um, uh, you've got your um, oculomotor nerve paresis as well. So um, this is just uh, to show you how you know, you can go through all of these, the pons, you can go through uh, the various uh, pontine syndromes that correlate. You have the peritrigeminal syndromes that affect the um, uh, both the uh, corticospinal tract and the MCP here and cause some ataxia. You have the, uh, the middle peduncular lesions that cause ipsilateral face, uh, hemisensory loss, the contralateral uh, medial lemniscus symptoms, uh, the spinal thalamic tract, and um, you, you can essentially make your diagnoses without MRIs. You can make it with just um, a good clinical examination and this um, putting together of the findings. The INO is classic for lesions in the floor of the fourth ventricle in the pontine segment, and these are the various types of an INO that you can get uh, depending on the level of the lesion. Um, Here's this super olivary pontine lesion. This is classic, causes a six nerve palsy. Ipsilateral to the lesion as the nerve exits the pontomedullary sulcus. And um, um, sometimes you'll get a fifth or a seventh nerve associated with that as well, shown here, uh, the Miller Gubler syndrome. And moving on down into the medulla, same story. You can get a pyramidal syndrome here with Desjardins syndrome with. Um, tongue deviation and a hemiparesis that is um, contralateral. You can get an olivary lesion here causing the anterior Wallenberg syndrome. And finally, um, the cuneate lesion um, causes a posterior Wall Wallenberg syndrome. And the, um, the ones towards the back are much easier. They affect the uh, um, uh, dorsal column nuclei here, just causing leg uh, numbness, isolated leg numbness that could be ipsy or uh, uh, bilateral, and then um, uh, trigonal. These are the ones in the floor of the fourth ventricle below the stria medullaris that cause um, uh, dysphagia and dysphonia, as well as severe nausea and vomiting. So that's a very quick run through the various clinical syndromes. Um, and um, you know, hopefully you'll have time to look at the publications in more detail and study the the, the illustrations, the illustrations are fantastic. Um, you know, I had my artists here work on those and um, they bring together these uh, wonderful circuits um, and uh, the pathology and the, they, they do require some study, but uh, I think uh, hopefully if you do that, you'll get a sense of um, how these lesions fit with the, uh, with the pathways in the brainstem and cause these clinical constellations. So <clears throat> moving on to the approaches, the, the real benefit in my mind of the taxonomy is the approach selection. I think one of the hardest things with these lesions is first patient selection, but then second, um, surgical selection. Should I uh, operate and, and how should I operate? And each one of these um, subtypes has its own unique uh, approach. And the beauty of the taxonomy is that if you categorize the, the lesion according to the subtype, it will pair the lesion with the, what I would call the correct approach. And so um, that's really the beauty is you, you, once you have a subtype, you have, uh, it will lead you to the approach. And so I'll just walk you through, um, through the approaches. This is the interpeduncular lesion. The approach is an orbitozygomatic craniotomy. 
and we're going to go transylvian and interpeduncular. And so this is the ultimate surgical view that you're going to get. It's very much like approaching a basilar apex aneurysm, where you go uh, lateral to the carotid, medial to the third nerve, you follow the third nerve back to the basilar apex, and just behind that, you're going to get to the interpeduncular fossa, you're going to work through the thalamoperforates, and you'll get uh, to the lesion here. There are safe entry zones that are available. Um, they are the um, uh, interpeduncular safe entry zone right in the middle. And um, you can see the valuable real estate is the red nuclei and the corticospinal tracts, which uh, lie just to the side. Um, so that's the interpeduncular approach. Uh, I'll skip uh, the videos in the interest of time uh, and just show you the artwork here. This next one is the peduncular lesion. Uh, this now is the same craniotomy, same transylvian approach, but instead of going medial to the third nerve, we'll be going lateral to the third nerve, right to the, the uh, cerebral peduncle, which you see here. So our uh, safe entry zone, if necessary, is the anterior mesencephalic, straight ent uh, safe entry zone, and we have to stay medial to the corticospinal tract. The... Um, Oops, let me uh, skip this as well. The next one is the tegmental uh, cavernous malformation. I like to do these in the sitting position uh, through a retrosigmoid craniotomy. That allows the cerebellum to, to descend a little bit with gravity. And um, it takes us right to this uh, posterior lateral surface of the, um, of the midbrain. The fourth nerve you see right in the center here. And um, it's a very uh, helpful landmark that will guide your, your um, your dissection. Um, the distal branches of the SCA are also uh, right in the field. Um, so you have to choose a pathway either supratrochlear or infratrochlear, depending on where this comes to the surface. The um, lateral mesencephalic sulcus is your safe entry zone. It's where the crease of the peduncle ends and the um, uh, tegmentum begins. And usually it's overlying, uh, overlied by this lateral mesencephalic vein, and you can enter right in that spot. The, um, the uh, next one here is the um, quadrigeminal um, lesion here. This one I do from a um, sitting position, again, uh, supracerebellar infratentorial uh, approach um, in the midline uh, through a torcular craniotomy. You see the torcular craniotomy here. Uh, straight down the middle, and it takes you to uh, what I refer to as the infragalenic triangle. It's that space between basal vein of Rosenthal, the precentral cerebellar vein, just right in that little angle right there. And uh, this gives you a perfect shot. Uh, there are multiple safe entry zones that you can use, the um, uh, intercollicular, supracollicular, or infracollicular safe entry zones. Uh, but typically, these lesions are right there on the surface, and um, you can get right to it uh, through uh, just entering the lesion directly. The uh, eloquent anatomy is shown in the lower right. You have to watch the superior and inferior colliculi. Deep to them is the red nucleus. You have the decussation of the fourth nerves um, below them, which you need to stay above. Uh, but this provides a very nice corridor. And with this gravity retraction and sitting position, uh, you have a nice open space. The, um, the next one is um, the periaqueductal. This one is um, uh, a beautiful approach. Uh, I do this through a bifrontal, transcolossal, transcoroidal fissure approach. You can see the uh, beautiful anatomy in this picture. With gravity, the, uh, the dependent hemisphere will drop so that you can get right down the inner hemispheric fissure to the corpus callosum. A um, transcolossal dissection will take you into the lateral ventricle. As you open up the choroidal fissure, you enlarge the frame of Monroe, which you see right here. You'll enlarge that backwards so that you open into the third ventricle. You come upon the massa intermedia. You come upon the medial walls of the thalamus. And if you keep aiming back, you'll see the aqueduct. And these lesions typically sit along this rim, around the rim of the um, uh, the aqueduct, so they're the, in the very top of the midbrain, which is the floor of the third ventricle, 
and uh, that will take you there. All right, so um, looking at the midbrain, you can see um, these are the different subtypes, the various um, uh, patient outcomes, and by and large, um, these approaches that I'm advocating uh, really uh, performed well. The patients did well, and um, you know we had uh, we had uh, good outcomes seen. So um, next is the pons. The the pons has uh, six subtypes and six different unique approaches, and I'll just uh, walk you through those. Uh, the first is the basilar subtype, and that for that we just do a terional with a quasi uh, uh, approach. So the quasi's bone of the uh, anterior petrous bone is shown here. Uh, the borders for that are the GSPN, lateral border of the fifth nerve, superior petrosal sinus and the petrous ridge, and arcuate eminence. I think all of you are well aware of Kawazi's triangle. And when you open that space and work between five and seven, you have a nice shot at the anterior surface of the pons. You can see your lateral to the basilar. You're working between these um, circumflex perforators off of the basilar trunk, and this provides your window. Um, the, these lesions sit medial to what I call the trans olivary line. This is a term from Roten, uh, drawing a line up from the uh, midpoint of the olive, or um, the sixth nerve will give you a sense of that, uh, that same uh, anatomy. And so if you see six and you're medial to six, you're in that basilar territory. The ob uh, obviously the key um, eloquent structures here are the descending corticospinal tract fibers. And those are shown in blue here, and those have to be carefully protected. So um, the next one is um, the uh, peritrigeminal. Uh, we see a lot of these. These are uh, lesions that are located on the anteromedial uh, surface of the, um, uh, or, sorry, the anterolateral surface of the pons. And um, they're right uh, around the, uh, the trigeminal uh, nerve. They're, they're medial to the nerve, uh, typically above or below. Uh, you can see um, in this illustration, this one is sitting above. I do an extended retrosigmoid approach and a um, dissection through the cerebellopontine angle. That will take you right to the lesion. The, um, the safe or the triangular spaces of access are either supratrigeminal, infratrigeminal, uh, or uh, you can go even lower into the GCT or the glossopharyngeal cochlear triangle. So you see those three different areas of access into the cerebellopontine cistern, and those get you medial to the, the cranial nerves into this, this next strip of the pontine surface. The, um, the next uh, territory here is the middle peduncular lesions. Now these are going to be lateral to um, uh, the entry site, I should say, is lateral to the cranial nerves. The lesion itself is, um, is in the, the lateral portion of the pons where the middle cerebellar peduncle overlies that lateral surface. But to get to these, you enter through the, the, uh, the MCP or the middle cerebellar peduncle. The, the way that you get in is you have to separate the petrosal fissure. It's the uh, otherwise known as the horizontal fissure. It separates the superior and the inferior semilunar lobules. It sits uh, just above the flocculus. So you have to split this like you would a sylvian fissure. And the way I like to do that, I like to look for the ica as it comes around the, um, uh, the brainstem, and it will dive into that horizontal fissure. And so by following the, ar the arterial branches into the fissure, you'll separate the two lobules and you'll get right down on this um, lateral extent of the MCP, which will um, take you to the entry site. Now, it's very rare that these come to the surface. The, I did one the other day that was just right on the surface here, but most of the time you've got to do a, um, a safe entry through the, the white matter track of the peduncle and uh, get, get your way down to the lesion in that manner. And so um, um, this is just... Uh, an example of what that looks like. This is the, uh, the uh, horizontal fissure here. Ica's coming in here. You have to separate this to get your way into, the, uh, into that space. Now, the inferior peduncular one is um, really a, a approach into the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle. 
I use a suboccipital craniotomy, a telovelar approach. If you take down the inferior medullary vellum, you follow the choroid plexus out into the lateral recess and then jump above that. This is where these inferior pedunculate lesions will live. It's basically in the ICP uh, as the ICP curves into the peduncle above the choroid in, uh, and above the lateral recess. So um, your safe entry zone for this, if you need it, is in the area acoustica. Uh, you've got to be careful of the vestibular nuclei and the uh, nuclei in the floor of the fourth ventricle. Um, these can be uh, very costly. So ideally, you want the lesion right there on the, on the brainstem surface. The, um, the next one is the rhomboid. These are moving more medially in the floor of the fourth ventricle. These sit above the stria medullaris. That's our dividing line between medulla below it and pons above it. And here you have to worry about the facial colliculus. The facial colliculus is um, where the facial nerve wraps around the sixth nerve nucleus. And so um, the lesion has to be on the surface uh, through that ependymal uh, surface, or uh, you have to map it out using uh, stimulation mapping so that you can select your entry zone uh, either above or below the facial colliculus. Last but not least is the supraolivary lesions. These um, <clears throat> are right at the pontomedullary sulcus. Uh, the approach is through a far lateral exposure. Uh, you go through the vago accessory triangle, which is the space between the inferior margin of 10 and just uh, lateral to the 11th nerve, and it's right there. It's right in that space there. And um, these are uh, beautiful lesions because, you know, it's um, uh, by going through that sulcus, you can get upwards into the pods. Your viewing angle from the far lateral exposure is upwards. So uh, you have a good trajectory into that space and um, uh, you can get uh, to these lesions uh, quite nicely. So uh, here's our table for the ponds, again, showing the six different subtypes, good results with each of them, and it just validates the, uh, the approach recommendations that we're making here. Now onto the medulla. The medulla will be easy because we've already talked about most of these approaches. Uh, but you can see the five different approaches for the pyramidal lesions. We're going to do a far lateral, but to, to get around the corner uh, and medial to the olive, you, you really have to um, push the far lateral a little, a little bit. Uh, I like to uh, go in front of the 11th nerve and uh, really um, uh, drive the, the view as far forward as you can. And in these uh, cases, you can see around the corner to the, uh, to the pyramids. For the next one, the olivary ones, these are easier. Uh, here, you don't have to get medial to the hypoglossal nerve rootlets. You're basically between 9, 10, and 11 posteriorly, and 12 anteriorly, right in the, in the olive itself. And uh, you can uh, uh, access these through the, the vago accessory triangle. It's very much like a pica aneurysm. This is where most of the pica approaches will take you. Um, and so pica is running right by. But you can see this lesion comes right uh, to the surface, and uh, that's what you look for. There are safe entry options here in the olivary zone or in this retro olivary sulcus here, um, if necessary. The, um, the next one here is the, uh, the cuneate uh, nucleus. So this is basically a lesion that's in the um, uh, cuneate tubercle or the cuneate nucleus is below the lateral recess, so it's posterior lateral. The gracile tubercle, we'll talk about in a minute, but that's just medial uh, or paramedian. And um, this one, again, requires a telovelar approach, taking down that inferior medullary vellum and getting out uh, a little bit more laterally. The, uh, the gracile lesion shown here is uh, uh, really uh, more medial. Um, and uh, it's usually um, at the level of the obex. Um, and uh, th these are really quite easy to get to because they're uh, so accessible. Um, uh, last but not least is this uh, trigonal lesion. These are in the floor of the fourth ventricle. They're in the medulla, so they're below the stria medullaris. You have here your hypoglossal trigone uh, here. You have your vagal trigone uh, below and lateral to that and you have your area postrema. These are what form the calamus scriptorius of the fourth ventricle floor. 
And so lesions there, you uh, really uh, look for them either being right there on the surface, or sometimes you can go down the median sulcus safely and get to those if they're in the midline. So uh, here's our table for the, uh, the medullary lesions, again, showing the, uh, the five different types, good outcomes with these, and um, uh, again, validating the, uh, the approaches. Now, um, the next topic is the topic of triangles. And, um, you know, with triangles, um, I I've always liked triangles. They um, deepen our anatomical knowledge. And more importantly, um, they're landmarks when you're doing your dissection. If, if you're getting lost, if you're having a tough time finding your target, the triangle will help guide you. It's kind of like landing lights for an airplane during fog. Uh, and and I, I view them as um, these really hard and fast um, uh, landmarks that will get you or, or orient you as you find your way to these targets. Um, the triangle concept, um, uh, I'll talk about it in a minute, but we, we've come up with this um, system of 14 brainstem triangles, some of which already existed, like the Kawazi triangle. Others we uh, invented because um, there wasn't anything there and we needed to kind of put something out there. So the, the ones in, um, in uh, kind of orange, uh, we, we published uh, as they relate to aneurysms or bypasses um, previously. The, um, the ones in white, like carotid ocular motor and quasi already existed. These, um, the ones in, in yellow are relatively new triangles or new names of triangles, which, um, you know, like infragalenic, we all know that, but um, if you start talking about it with the with a consistent um, name, um, we'll all be speaking the same language. So interlobular, we talked about for the um, uh, trans MCP approach. Th these are uh, new triangles that I think uh, are helpful to uh, to kind of put out there. Um, the the triangle concept um, is. It comes from um, target shooting. And when you think about um, trying to hit a target with a rifle or a gun, what you're doing when you're aiming is you've got a rear sight and a front sight. And in order to increase the accuracy of the shot, you have to line the two sights together. It's not enough just to have a rear sight or a front sight, but by having both and aligning your target with both of those, you, you're really steering the gun barrel to match the uh, um, to, to, to hit the target. And the analogy um, really applies for the surgical uh, approach. You need a craniotomy, which is your rear sight. You need a front sight, which is the triangle. And the approach is really just the gun barrel. And that gets you going down the right pathway. But you, you need that front sight to really uh, aim the, uh, the gun properly. So, um, these are the triangles, and and these. Um, if you think about the triangles in that manner, you know you have to select your craniotomy and approach, but the triangle will really uh, specify exactly where you need to go. Um, these are some of the triangles. Um, I'll just uh, show this overview picture, uh, but we'll walk through some of these. The carotid ocular motor triangle, I think, is very familiar to everybody from aneurysm surgery uh, between the carotid and the third nerve. The um, ocular motor tentorial triangle is shown here. It's between the tentorium and the third nerve lateral to the ocular motor triangle. Uh, the supracerebellar triangles, there are two of them. Uh, there's one that's super, super trochlear. So as we go over the cerebellum and over the trochlear nerve, we can get into this um, space here. These are typically best for the more medial lesions. And as we go more lateral, um, the uh, the trochlear nerve drops a bit, and uh, we're, we're in this space here. Uh, so you can see here for this lesion, we're underneath the trochlear nerve to get to this one. So two triangles in that space. The infragalenic triangle, we uh, discussed this a little bit. It's between BVR uh, and the precentral cerebellar vein gets you to the quadrigeminal uh, or tectal plate. Kawazi's triangle, uh, we all know this from our skull base approaches under the fifth nerve, over the seventh and eighth nerve, and through that, those two dural leaflets of the petrous apex. The super trigeminal triangle here, um, you, you see the fifth nerve here, and we're gonna go over the, uh, 
or above the fifth nerve, below the tentorium, through a retrosigmoid approach. The infratrigeminal uh, triangle here is uh, under five and over eight in this space here. And then GCT or glossopharyngeal cochlear is obviously between eight and nine um, to get to that uh, lower portion of the pons. The interlobular triangle is the approach to the MCP, splitting that um, uh, horizontal fissure and following the ica branches down to that surface of the MCP laterally. The vertebrobasilar junctional triangle is what we use for the pyramidal lesions. This is following the confluence of the vertebral arteries you see here, V4, right and left. And just in the crotch of those arteries is this triangle. And that gets you to the, the pyramids on the medullary surface. Here's our famous vago accessory triangle between 11 and 10 and the surface of the medulla. Here's the molecular. Uh, hello, sir, uh, Fonso. So pleased to welcome you here with us today. I'm promoting you as the co-host. Hello. Hi, sir. Hi, sir. Welcome to the to the webinar. So thank you very much for um, joining us today and for sparing your time. Okay, thank you. So you can, uh, I'm just, uh, I've promoted you as a co-host, you can, uh, if you like, you can test your slideshow uh, and then we will okay. proceed. So I'm going to share my, my presentation. Uh, exactly. Yes, sir. So you can just give it a try. Okay, perfect. We can see you perfectly. Okay. Uh, okay. Can I uh, am I sharing the 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 presentation correctly, or? Uh, so you will have to convert it into the slideshow mode. Uh, okay. Yes, it's perfect, sir. It, it, it's the right way, exactly, sir. We can very well see it. But they they don't they don't go. Uh, let me. They are not advancing. I'm not seeing there. They are advancing at the moment. Hmm. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a just stuck. Okay. Yeah. Now, now it's working. Now it's working. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We can very well see you. Thank you very, very much, sir, for uh, uh, joining us today for this webinar. We had a part one already a couple of um, hours ago, and we were just really looking forward to welcoming you today for this very interesting topic. So again, thank you very, very much for sparing time on this very, on, um, on, on you know, on, on Sunday. So obviously it means a lot and we were all looking so forward. Okay, uh, so, so uh, shall we uh, wait or shall we be begin already or? Uh, so, uh, if, uh, since uh, we've got a few viewers with us today, uh, we have this interval where we have a screen playing recording. So, if uh, if you like, we can just proceed. Uh, we are just six minutes uh, earlier than the right time. So, if you wish, we can just proceed with the with the webinar. Okay, so so I I, I can I can begin with my talk then. Yes, exactly. I will just give a, I okay. will just give a short uh, introduction. Uh, um, everyone, please let us welcome Professor Alfonso Lagares Gomez. He's the head of neurosurgery service at the University Hospital, October 12. He's the professor of neurosurgery at Complutense University of Madrid. He's the research coordinator for neurotomatology at American wide hemorrhage in the neuroscience areas in IMS 12 Research Institute. He's the editor of Revisiting Neurochirurgia, which is the Office General of the Spanish Neuroscience 
Neurosurgical Society. He's a member of editorial board of the Brain Science and Brain Spine, both included in the JC JCR. He's a member of Spain Society of Neurosurgery and the European Association of Neurosurgeons, the ENS, and the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, that is the double ANS. So it's um, we are quite lucky to have you with us today to deliver such an important lecture with us, which is of our great interest. And we've been all looking so forward uh, and uh, to welcome you and to listen to your amazing lecture. So Professor Alfonso will be delivering a lecture on blood biomarkers in traumatic brain injury. So again, thank you so much, sir. The floor is all yours and welcome to the show. We are so happy and so honored to have you with us today. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about uh, blood biomarkers in traumatic brain injury and, and their different uses. I have to um, um, make first a disclosure. I'm I'm working in, uh, already in two consortiums with with uh, with Biomedio, which is a um, um, a company based in France to uh, for the development of blood biomarkers uh, for TBI. This is in a, in in the in the in the, in the, with the funding of of AT Health, which is also a um, um, a, 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 a brand for for funding for European um, for European um, projects. Um, it's not working properly. Sarah, please take your time. It's okay. I know uh, we are all having some sort of net issues, especially with Zoom. You can stop sharing and reshare it if it is. Uh, if, if it uh, is. I think that the, uh, the 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 here now. Okay, so it's because of the connection of internet, I guess. So, um, so I'm going to talk uh, first about the, uh, a short introduction about the interest, definition, and kinds of, of biomarkers that uh, can be um, uh, can be used. And I will also try to um, answer some questions pertaining TBI uh, blood biomarkers, um, uh, talking about how do they get out of the central nervous system, uh, for how long can we measure them, and what would be the ideal moment to measure them, uh, some confounding factors in their analysis and also talk about the clinical utility in the management of mild TBI, the diagnosis of CT and MR lesions, uh, and the conclusion in athletes, and talk again about something about uh, prognosis as well. I think it's the connection with internet because it's, this is... So as low is not working. Uh, exactly. I think that it's a little unstable from our side as well. Sometimes this happens because I was also hold, holding this uh, meeting today and I also suffered from a lot of this uh, issue today. <coughs> Sorry about that. No, <laughs> it's okay, sir. No, it's not working. Uh, sir, if you like, you can um, stop sharing and share it again. Maybe that will work. Okay, I'll try. Yes, but we all, I, I'm, I'm, I've been noticing that we are having a lot of issues uh, today with the internet. Can you see the slides? Uh, yes, we can. You just need to convert it into um, slide share. Okay. So um, I will continue then. Um, so um, are they changing for you? Uh, no, no, we cannot see it. Uh, it hasn't yet become, uh, you know, the slideshow proper right now for us. Okay. Yes, uh, if we can see- Now they can... are changing, okay. Uh, so- no, uh, Yes, exactly. Thank you, yes, exactly. Thank you. Okay, I will continue then. So first of all, you have to you have to acknowledge that there is a, a, a clear tendency of, of, of publishing and publishing more on TBI biomarkers. 
these are the data on on the on the different papers that have been published during the different years and you see that there is a rise in the in the interest in the in the uh, in the research on, on biomarkers on on tbi if you use both uh, uh, words for the for the search you see that the the number of papers published is increasingly uh, quite rapidly um, the definition uh, of of a biomarker would be a defined characteristic that is objectively measured as an indicator of a normal biological process, patho pathogenic processes or responses to an exposure or intervention, including therapeutic interventions. So they are going to be molecules that are going to change depending on the severity of the, of the impacts of the lesion. They are going to change also uh, through time uh, if there is lesion progression. And also they will change if an intervention uh, uh, diminishes the, the burden of the TBI uh, for instance, if, if, if there is a, a treatment that uh, make a, 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 a some kind of, uh, of response uh, uh, in TBI, then we will be able to measure a decrease in the biomarkers. So they would be they can be also used as uh, secondary outcome measures in, in trials uh, in order to measure the effect of a drug. Biomarkers should be sensitive. They should be able to correctly detect. Or, 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 identify, uh, or identify those patients with uh, the illness, and they should correlate, for instance, with the severity of the injury. They should be as also as specific, so they will be uh, they will be not uh, they will be able not uh, to to not detect those who are uh, uh, same who don't have uh, the, the the illness. They should be selective. Uh, um, they should be safe uh, uh, in in terms of uh, sensitivity. Uh, uh, for instance, if you are going to use uh, a biomarker for the detection of, of lesions in the city, then it should be used in, uh, with safety. It should be able to be a, a So they should be uh, uh, also well characterized, uh, uh, be able to be to 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 uh, to measure. Uh, and to um, 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 we should be able to uh, to uh, be able to measure the half life, the crayons, the kinetics. Uh, they should be reproducible. Uh, this is, uh, they should be we should be able to measure them in different labs and have uh, uh, equal uh, measures. And that is something very uh, very important and very difficult to to obtain in clinical practice because uh, every time we are seeing that different papers from different labs. Uh, uh, use different uh, um, antibodies, and therefore we have uh, different uh, measures. And, and this uh, this is uh, something that determines that the the the, the biomarker the biomarker studies are very difficult to reproduce, and they should be also optimized. They should be a specific in a context of use. They should be uh, optimized to be used, for instance, in the emergency rooms or to be used uh, in the bed at the bedside of the patients. So with uh, biomarkers, we would be able to determine the severity of the lesion uh, the, uh, um, uh, as, as we use, for instance, the CT. The CT, in a way, is also a biomarker in a way, but blood biomarkers, should uh, we should be able, be able to use them as the CT. The, we should be also uh, be able to use them as for the prediction of the result of the patient, also to identify pathological processes, and in that uh, way, identify therapeutic targets. Uh, biomarkers are uh, a, a reflection of the response of the of the body to the injury. So, therefore, uh, identifying uh, uh, certain biomarkers, we should also be able to measure uh, those uh, targets, those uh, pathways in which um, uh, the the lesion or the pathological process is making harm. Uh, also, to guide therapy. Uh, by a response of a biomarker, we would be uh, able to check that the drug is effectively doing what the drug is meant to, to do, and also to monitor recovery or to assess the future of the patient. There are different blood biomarkers that have been studied, and this uh, uh, only reflects the different uh, uh, cell types and uh, areas in which the biomarker is, is, uh, is produced. Uh, um, by reflection of the damage of the cell. Uh, for instance, there are uh, neuronal cell injury biomarkers. 
uh, determining the, the the damage to uh, to neuronal injury to to neurons. Uh, this is, for instance, the NLAS, uh, uh, neuron specific NLAS or UCHL1. Uh, also, uh, glial cell injury biomarkers, the most famous is S100B, which has been widely used uh, in Northern Europe. Uh, uh, and also GFAP, uh, the, um, the, this, and this protein is now, uh, is, is now um, uh, used in different studies. Also, axonal uh, injury biomarkers, uh, as the neurofilament, uh, myelin-based uh, protein or the tau protein, which are marks of axonal injury. Inflammation, inflammation biomarkers, these are a, a widespread use, uh, for instance, uh, interleukins or um, uh, SAA1 uh, or ikai uh, 40L, which are different um, uh, biomarkers of inflammation. And extracellular vesicles are, are now um, also a, a new um, gateway for um, for uh, the finding of, of biomarkers. These are uh, vesicles uh, produced by the damage of cells and the fragmentation of these cells. Uh, uh, they, uh, uh, we can find in the blood of the patients uh, the presence of, of um, little vesicles surrounded uh, with uh, membranes. And uh, these are uh, exosomes, which are also uh, a, a ways, ways of uh, transmitting information uh, between cells uh, in different areas of the body. And we can find in, uh, also inside of them uh, micro RNA, RNAs, which are uh, fragments of uh, RNA, which, is, uh, which, which are uh, used for the body to communicate uh, uh, in, in a cell to cell interaction. So, this, uh, this is a widespread, uh, as you see, um, um, area in which uh, uh, things are changing very quickly. And we have uh, to be aware of the different biomarkers and the different. Um, um, cell types which are uh, pro uh, in which they are produced and how do they um, escape the cns because uh, uh, we normally feel that uh, we know we normally know that uh, cns is protected from the blood in a way uh, from uh, in a way that uh, it's somehow uh, independent of 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 the blood uh, by the blood brain barrier uh, which is normally uh, uh, which normally isolates the brain from from blood circulation in a way in which big proteins cannot escape the central nervous system and or go into the central nervous system. Uh, this blood brain barrier is is formed by the the endocyte the by that by sorry by the by the by the by the endothelium and uh, and also by uh, astrocytes. Uh, um, um, which uh, uh, make tight junctions between between uh, the, these astrocyte end fits and, and make the, the the capillaries very firmly um, um, uh, separate uh, separated from the from the, from neurons and from the extracellular space of the brain. Uh, you know that this uh, um, blood brain barrier can be damaged by the by the by the by the trauma. And in that way, uh, uh, dying neurons, dying astrocytes can uh, uh, liberate different uh, molecules, big proteins that can go through the blood brain barrier if this blood brain barrier is uh, damaged. And this is something that uh, can be damaged with uh, small trauma. And there, there is, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, evidence that the blood, blood, blood brain barrier is damaged. Uh, uh, by uh, mild concussion, of course, by by severe tra traumatic brain injury and by lesions uh, uh, such as are uh, seen uh, in the in these CTs and, and MR, and and of course these uh, proteins like NLAs uh, or S100 or GFAP produced by the by the uh, destruction of uh, these cells can go into the blood uh, through uh, through this damaged uh, blood uh, blood brain barrier. However, there are other other uh, possible. Um, and ways uh, that uh, that make uh, possible for these uh, proteins to go into the into the blood, and, and the glial lymphatic system and the lymphatic system of the meninges are now um, 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 positioned as another system to uh, for the for these proteins to go into the blood. You know that there is a. a, a um, 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 it's now evidence that there is a. Uh, continuous 
uh, drainage of the of the um, extracellular space of the of, of the brain parenchyma uh, by by CSF that is impulse, imposed uh, by uh, by the pulsatility uh, transmitted by the by the blood uh, through the through the big uh, vessels in the in the brain and this pulsatility makes uh, uh, possible for for the CSF to to go uh, and and uh, take some uh, proteins and molecules from the extracellular um, uh, space and make it uh, um, again uh, uh, through the capillaries and through the through the um, uh, venous uh, uh, spaces uh, into the into the blood uh, space again this uh, this uh, way of uh, of getting uh, proteins and molecules from the brain to the blood is uh, still uh, 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 less um, important than that of the uh, of the damaged uh, blood brain barrier uh, for the for the um, these molecules to to escape the cns and go into the blood and for how long do they stay detectable and when it is best to detect them well theoretically they should appear after initial trauma uh, of course uh, a secondary injury can make uh, the the appearance of blood brain uh, of blood uh, biomarkers of uh, biomarkers coming from the from uh, injured injured cells into the brain and into the blood uh, more easily to be uh, detected and and there could be another peak of the detection these uh, biomarkers can stay in the blood for uh, long and there's different stability in the blood uh, uh, and different metabolism uh, uh, with the different biomarkers there is hepatic and renal excretion of some of them um, but of course, uh, also there is a, a, the, the, the possibility that peripheral tissue could capture some biomarkers or be, or be the site of liberation of others. For instance, uh, it's, it is well known that S100 can be uh, liberated also uh, in, the, in the event of polytrauma. And therefore, uh, this is not, uh, um, if, if there is a big uh, uh, polytrauma, uh, some biomarkers can be liberated um, uh, uh, and be the same biomarker in the periphery. So uh, this is a, um, 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 a source of bias or a source of error in the determination of these biomarkers. Uh, and it is very difficult to establish really their, their half-life because it depends also in the, in, uh, it is very difficult to make a good uh, half-life or ha good experiments in real, in real world, uh, with real world data. And, and it is really difficult also to establish their uh, half life based on uh, um, antibodies, uh, in essence, based on, on antibodies on these uh, proteins. So you see that um, uh, with, the, with the primary injury, we would uh, see a, a, a big uh, cell death uh, in, uh, de determined by this uh, primary injury. And with this second, uh, with this uh, health, uh, with this. Um, um, brain damage, we, we would see a big um, 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 expression of, of biomarkers in the blood. But again, with uh, this acute phase, there would be a secondary cell death, um, and we will see a, a, a rise in these biomarkers. Uh, inflammation could uh, uh, increase again uh, the, the cell death, and of course, uh, be a, a source of, of again a, a rise in these biomarkers. But this is this can go through the acute phase of the injury and also in the chronic phase, and of course we could see also uh, uh, an increase in biomarkers with uh, with uh, the generation of this uh, of of any of uh, of of the damage produced by the uh, first and secondary damage. So we will see biomarkers that are acutely expressed after injury. Uh, these will be acute biomarkers like UCHL1, S100. Uh, and GFAP, but uh, 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 these biomarkers could uh, uh, be expressed in minutes or in hours, and we will see a rise, a quick rise, and then uh, a decrease. Uh, then we will see biomarkers that will be expressed through days and not uh, at the beginning, like uh, biomarkers related to apoptosis or uh, uh, biomarkers related to inflammation or neurodegeneration. neurodegeneration. And we will see autoimmunity increase uh, with time, and this will be uh, uh, measured as chronic biomarkers. So depending on the type of uh, molecule, we will uh, expect it to rise at the beginning, some, uh, uh, because there will be acute phase biomarkers. 
and uh, others will be only measured. We, uh, we will be only be, be able to measure them after some time after the injury. So depending on the molecule we are looking at, uh, we will uh, need to uh, search at a different time point and we will have to extract blood at a different time point. And it, the, their, their findings will be different depending on the time of extraction of the, of the analysis. So when, when uh, uh, um, investigators have investigated the kinetic parameters of uh, biomarkers, they have seen that the half-life has been different from different biomarkers. For instance, for UCHL1, or, uh, the, the half-life is, is shorter than that of uh, GFAP and that of uh, neurofilament. And that expresses only the moment in which they are um, ex uh, excreted, uh, and also uh, the, 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 the time life, uh, the, the time uh, in which we will be able to measure them uh, uh, in blood. And depending on the time we are measuring the biomarker, there will be uh, differences in also in the area under the curve for different, uh, um, for different uh, means. For instance, if we are measuring the biomarker for um, um, searching the, the positivity, the searching lesions in CT, uh, the, uh, the, the best, uh, best half-life, for instance, the, the best uh, area under, under the curve for GFAP will be uh, 6 to 24 hours, uh, as you see in, in, this, in this image. If we are measuring this uh, uh, later on, if we are measuring GFAP later, uh, 24 hours to 48 hours, this will be not be uh, useful for measuring, uh, for instance, uh, concussion or not, or, or measuring uh, positivity in CT. So, uh, 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 if you are measuring, for instance, um, uh, tau, it will be better for to use it in the first six hours, and uh, if you measure it uh, later on then uh, um, the area under the curve is uh, less. So it is very important to know the half-life of the biomarker to determine the, the, the sampling of your study and also to, uh, to measure what you want to measure. Of course, uh, possibilities, there are possible, uh, possible biases or, or possible errors in your determinations because uh, there will be also in some biomarkers an extracranial contribution, like for instance, S100. And of course, there will be a source of error if there is ongoing brain injury because uh, 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 this will mean that you will have extra peaks of the, your, uh, in your concentration. Or for instance, if you are uh, uh, measuring the, the decrease in concentration, if there is a, a new secondary injury, then will you, you, you will have a secondary peaks in your concentration. And by that, uh, the, uh, you can also see uh, what is the time course of the biomarkers concentration in different patients. Uh, and it has been seen that uh, patients can have persistently high concentration at different time points. You can see also a, down, a downtrend uh, 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 um, um, of your concentration because you are not getting new lesions, but some patients get a, a, a downtrend reversal, like uh, in this red line in which you see that the patient is, is getting lower concentrations with time, but at one time point, there is an increase in this concentration. And this could mean that the patient has had a secondary injury or there is an increase, for instance, in the, in the blood, in the, in the endomatoma volume that you have at CT. So uh, uh, the increase in the concentration in some patients can also mark the, 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 the presence of, 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 of secondary injuries. And there are patients in which there is a downtrend, continuous downtrend, uh, and, uh, and this is and lower concentrations, and these are patients uh, that have uh, better prognosis. And what, is the, the, what are the sources of errors? Uh, um, uh, in different uh, in the different studies, well, the, you have to take uh, into consideration, as I have told, uh, said previously, the extraction time for, from TBI. Um, um, uh, it is very important that you you should measure the, the, the concentration at one time uh, and be aware of the different time that you are sampling uh, the blood. Uh, you should. It, it's also important uh, uh, if you are using assays based on plasma or on serum, 
and, and it, it is very uh, important because uh, you will uh, be able to measure different concentrations. Uh, plasma has a different uh, a different concentration of uh, proteins that have serum, and and that is uh, why uh, uh, you should always uh, take into consideration what kind of of uh, um, um, substance you are using at the end. Of course, there is systemic production of different um, biomarkers. For instance, uh, uh, enola, uh, um, although uh, enola, uh, neuron specific enolase, uh, it's called uh, like that is specific for uh, neurons. It's, it's, it's also known that it's produced in erythrocytes. So you have to be very careful that there is no hemolysis, as I will tell you uh, later, because hemolysis will make uh, uh, mm, mm, higher concentrations of, of uh, neuron specific nanolase without being uh, uh, this specific for the brain. S100B is only usable in the absence of systemic trauma because it, it is also produced in in the muscle or in and in in and in, and in in peripheral nerve tissue. So uh, this is very important. If there is systemic trauma, you will have higher concentrations of S100B, and this will be a source of a source of error. Also, uh, GFAP is produced in some um, um, peripheral tissues, and this is also a source a source of bias. The extraction procedure should be very carefully done. Hemolysis is also a, a, a way of a source of error, so the, you should be aware of that. The preservation of the samples uh, and the, the freeze and thaw cycles should be recorded, and sometimes uh, biomarkers are not stable. Uh, the detection methods can have different sensitivity and variability, and normal levels can vary with age and other conditions uh, like uh, comorbidities. Uh, so uh, you should be aware of that. Uh, most studies have not included patients with comorbidities, and this uh, have, uh, is also a source of error uh, because uh, the concentrations used as, as peak concentrations in uh, different studies have been used, uh, have been calculated without including uh, patients with comorbidities. And that is why uh, it is important that uh, these studies like Brainy 1 and Brainy 2 are uh, uh, are being pr produced. Brainy two is the, uh, is uh, taking care of patients in the elderly and pediatrics, and specifically in the elderly study, we are including patients uh, with comorbidities. So the we are trying to refine um, uh, the, the 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 lab values for GFAP and UCHL one used uh, in twelve hours for the detection of. Of uh, for the detection of, of um, lesions in the city, and we are running uh, this study now in Europe. We have something like uh, uh, recruited uh, 500, more than five hundred patients already, but we are uh, expecting to recruit uh, something like uh, one thousand five hundred at the end of two thousand and twenty-four to be able to use the BIDAS uh, TBI uh, as a means of uh, detecting. Um, lesions in the city and be uh, be able to include this uh, determination in guidelines for the management of mild TBI uh, in the emergency room. So um, uh, I was talking about different um, uh, ways of detecting biomarkers in, a, in in the in the in the detection in the, in the primary primary detection of these biomarkers. It is quite, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, for the analysis of this, we can use uh, protein electrophoresis, Western blood, but most uh, studies are uh, based on ELISA, which use, uh, 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 as you know, antibodies to detect uh, and a chromogen to detect these, uh, um, um, these uh, proteins in blood, uh, in, in, in serum and, and plasma. Uh, of course, we are uh, uh, the best, uh, uh, the most sensitive ones are quanterics, which are uh, only um, uh, present in some laboratories. Uh, but for instance, for GFAP, in many studies, uh, we can only detect uh, 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 in mild TBI, for instance, there, there is very low sensitivity for commercial lizards for GFAP. And uh, uh, that's why uh, we used uh, quanterics. In, uh, in many studies like in center TBI because this is much sensitive uh, study. But uh, what we want to at the end uh, produce is, uh, is to be able to measure these biomarkers uh, uh, in analyzers like the ones uh, uh, used for any other protein uh, uh, used in the emergency room 
uh, and it would be even better to have point of curse because in those point of curse, like uh, a point of care is a machine that you can use in the bedside of your uh, patient, uh, just uh, by your patient. And, uh, and the best uh, known uh, point of care is the detection of glucose, for instance, in, in uh, for diabetes uh, uh, testing. Uh, 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 and uh, this would be uh, quite useful for the uh, emergency rooms or for the transfer of patients, or even in the football fields uh, in, in the sports, because uh, you would be able to measure uh, GFIP or uh, any other biomarker to the tech concussion in athletes or in, in sports. But uh, they are, this is not uh, still uh, ready, although Abbott has already uh, filed a point of care for the use uh, in uh, uh, for detecting uh, uh, S100, uh, sorry, uh, GFAP and UCHL1, but this is not uh, ready to use because it's not, uh, it's not used uh, um, in whole blood, but only uh, with plasma. So you, you need to centrifuge the sample. Uh, and the uh, clinical utility of these biomarkers was uh, really the, the first to use a biomarker or to embed a biomarker uh, uh, were the, 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 Scandin the, the, the Scandinavians. Uh, they, uh, the Northern Europe, uh, in Northern Europe, they use, they use uh, uh, for, the, um, for, the for the management of mild TBI, S100B has been widely used uh, uh, in these countries, in the Scandinavian countries, and they uh, embedded this in their, in their clinical decision rules. But uh, it was uh, a little bit cumbersome because uh, although S100B can be used uh, in normal analyzers in the in the in the hospitals, um, the uh, S100B is only useful uh, in the first six hours of the trauma, and uh, and only uh, they could only use them if there is um, uh, not uh, um, of course not um, a polytrauma. So there are problems with the detection of S100 and the, its availability, and, and it's not used uh, in other European countries. Um, GFAP and UCHL1 has uh, has been um, have been used uh, uh, in different uh, settings, and of course, this uh, uh, in the track TBI and alert TBI cohorts, uh, um, uh, GFAP and UCHL1 have been used. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, a good example of, of their use. You see that uh, um, uh, with the GFIP and USHL1, I say there is there is a clear different difference in the in the in patients that have a, a positive CT for those that have a negative CT. And uh, uh, in this way, using a, a using this um, a setting in the first twelve hours of the trauma. With a with a, a specific uh, cut point for GFAP and UCHL1, there is a, 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 a very good negative predictive value of nearly of nearly one uh, for the detection of CT positive lesion uh, of CT positive uh, patients. Uh, that is, uh, patients with um, um, a positive CT. So you will be able to discharge patients using this. Uh, uh, clinical uh, these cutoffs with very high probability of not having a lesion in the city, and uh, and of course a, a 100% uh, uh, negative predictive value of not having a neurosurgical uh, uh, manageable uh, lesion. So you will be quite safe of de uh, detecting patients using these cutoffs. Of course, this is a, a, a study, and it is not uh, um, the whole picture because it's just one study, but, but it has enough evidence for the use. Of this, uh, of this, of these two biomarkers. However, these two biomarkers were used uh, using quantetics for detection, and this is an assay that will take some time for the detection, more than twelve hours. So, really, it's not worth it. Uh, and and this is why uh, Brainy One tried to uh, uh, make uh, this um, study uh, usable uh, in a in a normal analyzer, an analyzer being able to detect it. To, the, to make the, the process in just, in just half an hour. Uh, track TBI and center TBIs, uh, center TBI are, are, are two uh, large multi-center multinational data sets with biomarker sampling, with very large uh, uh, samplings. Uh, and, and, and this biomarker um, um, has uh, um, been obtained also with multiple clinical anim 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 data, with sets are reading both for biomarkers and imaging analysis. 
And uh, you know that Center TBI has recruited more than 4,500 patients uh, with different uh, patients in the ER stratum, admission stratum, and ICU stratum. And biomarkers have shown different levels for these uh, uh, different severities. You see that uh, for S100 uh, specific neur uh, neuron analyze or GFIP, there are differences between a stratum in the concentration of the biomarkers, also with uh, the class normal classification of TBI in mild, moderate, and severe. And of course, uh, um, the different uh, 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 biomarkers have shown similar results. Um, using GFAP, uh, we have uh, uh, Center TBI has demonstrated that it is uh, better uh, than clinical decision rules uh, uh, than um, uh, for all in, in all in all uh, samples. But uh, 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 using the biomarker GFAP, you see that it has um, a better uh, area under the curve than than clinical decision rules alone. Uh, for the different uh, um, uh, areas uh, of the study. And uh, in, the, uh, in determining the, in the, in the, the discriminative ability for uh, better in the different, uh, in the different um, areas. Of course, uh, 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 again, for um, uh, if, if we compare GFAP to S100, there is better uh, area under the curve for GFAP than S100. Uh, and therefore, uh, GFAP seems to be the, the, the most, the, the better um, positioned uh, biomarker for uh, determination uh, for CTS status, as you see, for the, for the correlation with the different uh, volumes of uh, 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 and, and concentrations of the different kinds of uh, lesions. And also for uh, the, the the determination of pres uh, presence of lesions in the city. Um, why it is the 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 the, the reason for combining uh, UCHL one and GFAP? Well, uh, it's it seems that GFAP concentrations are, uh, uh, um, take some time to increase after trauma. You see that the increase. Is a little bit. Um, uh, um, it takes some time. It takes up to eight hours to get to a concentration which is uh, different from the beginning, from the baseline concentration. And and this is not the case with UCHL one, which is quite uh, uh, acute and it decreases with time. So combining both biomarkers, it seems that uh, it will be logical to get a better result. However, uh, this is somehow um, in debate, and some authors. Uh, uh, really criticize the use of a, combi a combined test because, uh, of course, if you are combining tests, you are combined, you are getting a test that will be uh, much more expensive. And we are trying to get a, a, a test that should be a sp a specific enough, sensitive enough, and safe enough, but uh, very uh, uh, cheap. Of course, biomarkers are related to uh, to lysium volume, and this is uh, uh, um, something that is. Uh, always looked at, at, a, at a different biomarker which is proposed because uh, we want to see like a dose response uh, 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 reaction. If there is an increase in the volume of, of lesions in the CT after trauma, we will uh, uh, try to see that the concentration is higher because that means that there is a, a, a mechanism by which the, the, the biomarker is released. We are, uh, if there is a bigger lesion, we want to see a higher concentration. And this is something that it has been proven by Center TBI in the different um, with the different biomarkers. You see that uh, uh, the concentration of uh, of uh, different biomarkers increase with uh, the, uh, the the Marshall classification in the right, and you see that with the number of lesions there is an increase in the in the concentration of the bi different biomarkers as as uh, you get more lesions you get more uh, con uh, higher concentration. But it's, it's, it is not just that, because uh, it's not just CT, because there is also some uh, proof that uh, we are even able to detect those patients that have uh, lesions in the MR, uh, even if the if, even if the uh, even if there is no lesion in CT. 
You see the, in this uh, study in, from the Alert TBI cohort you, uh, and the Track TBI cohort, you see that patients that had uh, uh, both CT and negative CT had uh, uh, lower concentrations that those patients that even having uh, negative CT, they had um, lesions detected with MR, traumatic axonal injury, diffuse axonal injury lesions, and also some other lesions that are able to, uh, we are able to see with MR that are not really visible with CT. So uh, uh, um, uh, blood biomarkers could also select those patients that not having a positive CT could have lesions that are detectable uh, uh, with MR. Uh, and of course, there is a, the, the, the desire that these biomarkers could add to uh, the, the clinical uh, normally used uh, uh, models for, for prediction. You know that the crash and impact uh, models have, uh, are the normally mo are the more, uh, more wide, widespread used models for de uh, determining prognosis. And there are, uh, there are um, some evidence from both these two big studies, Center TBI and Track TBI, that uh, these uh, uh, biomarkers could add, uh, uh, GFIP and UCHL1 uh, could add to the clinical decision models. And of course, if you combine all biomarkers, uh, there is an, an increased uh, uh, um, um, ability of these models to get more, uh, more uh, better uh, adjusted predictions. So to conclude, blood biomarkers had a, a, have a bright future, especially in the management of mild TBI uh, and concussion. It is unclear; it is still unclear which combination of biomarkers alone uh, uh, could achieve better uh, results. There are many met methodological aspects which determine the need for robust met methodologies. You've seen that the time of destruction, the presence of hemolysis. The, the half-life of the biomarker and which biomarker you are trying to look at, it's, it's important. Uh, sources of errors elsewhere, elsewhere, because these are very complex proteins that can be, although you think that they can be only produced in the brain, but sometimes they are produced in, 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 in places which you cannot imagine. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this makes it uh, difficult the, 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 to compare also the different methods in different labs different uh, antibodies to detect the, the protein can make uh, a mess really because they can produce different, uh, completely different results. So uh, at the end, blood biomarkers uh, for TBI still need some, some more time to get to clinical practice, but for sure they will be part of the clinical work pack, uh, workup of the patients in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for this amazing talk and amazing lecture on this such an important and interesting uh, topic. So it means a lot to us. Thank you very, very much for sharing your vision and sharing your talk with us. So um, I don't think that there is any question in the chat box, but I do have one uh, question of my own. So most of the time, we usually discuss the role of blood biomarkers in the acute phase. Uh, but what's your view regarding uh, the value of blood biomarkers for TBI in the chronic phase, especially those blood biomarkers who are persistently raised in the chronic phase and those biomarkers which show a, a delayed peak that they have some biomodel type of distribution. So in that case, sir, uh, in, in most of the time in literature, they said that they do um, in, identify those patients who have an ongoing neurodegeneration or something like this. So what is your view about the value of these blood biomarkers in the chronic phase? Well, it really, it's it's uh, very interesting that, uh, your question because it's really a, a, a topic of research now. Uh, you know that uh, there is a lot. There, there are a lot of talks about the the, right, the, the risk of uh, dementia, uh, neurodegeneration in in patients uh, having, uh, for instance, in athletes having concussion, repetitive concussions. There is also a, a, a big uh, effort now in determining the role of neuroinflammation in those patients. So. Um, uh, the, the, these uh, biomarkers co could, of course, detect those patients that uh, can have uh, this uh, pathological process ongoing, neuroinflammation. Uh, the presence of, uh, for instance, uh, GFAP or tau or neurofilament uh, for a long time, for a longer period than expected uh, in these patients can talk about uh, neurodegeneration and the risk of dementia. 
there is a, a, a very interesting reports on uh, on football players in America, uh, in which uh, uh, if they have concussions, uh, some of them do not recover uh, after the end of the year or uh, or after holidays. And these patients that have consistent high levels of neurofilament should not be uh, uh, allowed to go to come back to play because they are in real risk of having uh, problems. So um, um, as you see, uh, the problem here is really to define uh, the times when we are measuring how different. So it's a little bit uh, difficult to follow uh, all this literature. So of course, this is uh, very interesting. They will have a role, but we have to define really um, what, what, which biomarker, which uh, uh, specific objective, and what we are trying to measure at the end. So yeah, there is a big, uh, big uh, role for uh, these chronic phase biomarkers in detection, in detecting uh, new pathways and maybe um, new treatments for these patients. Amazing. So thank you so much for the very elaborate question. This is a very interesting topic. So I sometimes believe that when they say that in the boxers, you know, it is quite important to have this, all these blows that they receive on their head and um, everything. And that leads to might be, you know, it's a hypothesis that they might lead to uh, Parkinson's disease later on. So sometimes uh, do are we supposed to believe that these biomarkers can help us in detecting that group? And especially I do have this uh, thing in my mind. Could it be some sort of a double hit phenomenon? Maybe some people are predisposed to a particular complication that is um, being, being enhanced with a double hit. Yeah, you, you are totally right. Um, um, well, uh, imagine we are trying to, uh, in Brainy2, for instance, uh, we are trying to measure, uh, to use these biomarkers in patients that are that have comorbidities like Parkinson's disease or dementia. The first thing we, we, uh, we have to do is to determine the baseline levels in patients with these kinds of, of uh, uh, processes going on. Um, uh, but of course, we only get a, a, a small um, snapshot of the, of the concentration of, of the biomarker. Um, at the end, we will have to, uh, to measure in a, in a good, in a good in, in the best way to do this would be to measure uh, patients that have, um, um, well, that have had this trauma and patients that are like uh, uh, partners, like uh, family or friends that have not uh, uh, have had not this trauma, but are of the same age, and follow them uh, concurrently uh, with biomarkers and with tests, uh, checking if they have this propensity for dementia for Parkinson. So um, of course, um, uh, the the fact is that uh, football players at uh, for instance, uh, they are, uh, as, as the general population, are in risk of having dementia or having Parkinson, but they are having them in a higher proportion than normal uh, patients. Um, so at the end, uh, you will need this kind of analysis, you know, um, going with uh, uh, partners that have the same probability uh, of having the same problem but uh, um, uh, and measuring the same biomarkers in these two groups of patients. Exactly. So the, the answer is not totally clear, but I hope that, uh, um, and I think that they are signaling something. Exactly. So they are basically going to take us somewhere. I hope someday, one day, that it will be a lot of um, yeah. exactly helpful for with people like you. All the doing things, this scientific um researches have been going on, and it's like we are always interesting. And I'm always looking forward to read about this new research work. And I've also uh, read so many of your papers, which have been so amazing and so helpful and so informative. So thank you very, very, very much again, sir, for um. Um, delivering your wonderful lecture and for spending time on on a Sunday morning. Obviously, it's it's a very busy day and it's a holiday day, so it means a lot. And uh, it's because of dedication of people like you that we are still doing our very best in um, in neurosurgery and in the research work. So thank you very very much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, sir. It was an honor to have you with us today. So I'm pleased to move on to our second speaker. Uh, she is uh, Professor Lini Lourdes, and uh, she has been uh, with us um, uh, this month in an earlier webinar. So it's a pleasure to welcome her again. Um, as you all know, she's been a very, very active uh, uh, member of neurosurgery and she's been delivering a lot of lectures on neurotrauma so she's she's the head of uh, the neurotrauma committee in the double a uh, sns and um, um um i think that uh, and she's a wonderful friend and a wonderful teacher and so it's an honor to welcome her again with us professor lini can you hear me hello and uh, uh to me uh, in the philippines it is uh, good evening and uh, in other parts of the world, maybe good morning and uh, good noon. And uh, it's a pleasure again to be here uh, with you, Noor, and all the others uh, coming in. So I think my lecture will be very a little bit short and um, more on going through all these complications, possible complications in neurotrauma and uh, the usual solutions or during my experience with uh, sharing some things with you. Okay, so um, uh, can I share my screen, please? Yes, so... ma'am, please. You're the co-host now. <laughs> and thank you very, very much again. I know you've been so busy today, but you yeah. still managed to uh, come and join us today. So it's it's a really big thing. Like I mentioned before, that it is because of people like you that we are still doing it. So again, thank you, thank you very, very much. I've I've uh, written your whole introduction in the chat box because you've got so many things to share, and I I knew that if uh, we have a lack of time, so I really wanted to yeah. wish to share something about you. Again, thank you so much. Yes, we are waiting. We can see your slides already. Okay, thank you. So it's complicated uh, managing complications of head injuries, mainly traumatic brain injuries. Okay, so no disclosures. So um, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, am I coming clear? You can see, am we can okay? see. Yes, yeah, okay. it's, it's perfect. So uh, it's a little bit difficult to really go through all these complications because number one, uh, you need to ask, uh, is this a time-related complication? So you can have a lot of early complications versus late complications. Is this a very related? You know, you have your mild, moderate, and severe uh, traumatic brain injury. So what are the, for example, you will ask yourself, what are the complications of mild traumatic brain injury? So what can you say about mild traumatic brain injury? There's concussion. So even concussions can actually have complications, something like memory lapses or even um, emotions, okay? So is this uh, organ system related, okay? So a lot of organ systems can actually be um, affected by traumatic brain injury, as I will mention later on. And uh, you, we all know that traumatic brain injury, there's the primary injury versus the secondary injury. So, are this also complications? But um, let me just go through them. Okay, so first of all, uh, what is primary injury versus secondary injury? So primary injury, that's the injury that takes place at time of impact, meaning either you have a car accident, that's a blunt traumatic brain injury or penetration, meaning you have an impalement of, of the brain from a, a steel rod or even a, you've fell, you have a ski accident, or there's a gunshot wound, okay, that's the primary injury at the time of impact. So the secondary injury is the damage to the brain that ensues afterward, meaning when you have this secondary injury, you can, can you consider this already as complications of traumatic brain injury? Some of the papers would, uh, a lot of papers would say these are already beginning complications because this is not the primary injury. Okay, so secondary injuries, uh, these are the common things we all know about hypoxia. Hypoxia meaning insufficient oxygen in the brain. So you may have patients who are, uh, their primary injury is very mild or maybe just diffuse axonal injury when you do the scan, but why is the patient GCS4 or 3? 
may be because of this complication or secondary injury, secondary to hypoxia, meaning during the transport, this patient was not able to receive sufficient oxygenation. So the result, resulting injury from hypoxia becomes hypoxic encephalopathy. So that's a very disas disastrous uh, complication and secondary injury to a patient. So second one is the hypo or hypertension, either alone or high blood pressure. So with the low blood pressure, we all know, again, there, there is the decrease of your circulation uh, be bringing your oxygen into your brain. So again, this may result into encephalopathies. And when high blood pressure also ensues, what can happen if this patient uh, blood pressure is not controlled? Secondary injury, meaning if you have a contusion, this may hemorrhage later on. So those are possible complications. And one dreaded complication across not just traumatic brain injury is cerebral edema, meaning swelling of the brain. So this is actually a sort of a vicious circle. If you have hypotension or, or uh, hypoxia, what happens is that you have cerebral edema. When you have swelling of the brain, the next complication or secondary injury, which is raised intracranial pressure happens. So when you have increased pressure within the skull, this is your increased intracranial pressure. So with all this, it, it's like a vicious circle. If you cannot control any of this, it, it keeps going on to the other until the patient goes into what I call herniation meaning parts of the brain are displaced, you have your subfoxin herniation, and the worst is that you have your uncal herniation. So these are the secondary injuries uh, leading to complications and possible, the worst complications is death for a patient. Okay, so next would be the time-bound complications. So you can have early complications within a short period of time. Again, in the studies, they, they cannot... But it's a short period of time in, in, in trauma. Usually, uh, they say, we all know that in traumatic brain injury, the first uh, 72 hours, you have a peak of cerebral edema. Okay, so is that uh, considered as the early complication? You can have bleeding and re-bleeding, meaning a lot of patients who come in within six hours can still, again, have an increase in the lesion after six hours. So these are actually possible complications within a short period of time. So again, swelling, because it's part of your secondary injury, and herniation, the worst kind, and even electrolyte abnormalities, and again, infections. So infections, what are they? They can range from, from the infection, uh, from, the, from the wounds that the patient actually sustained after the injury, maybe a neglected uh, fracture, or um, later on, uh, increasing to uh, meningitis, or even um, not so early, but um, depending on the classification or how, how early it came on, uh, aspiration pneumonia, and later on, uh, ventilator as, um, acquired pneumonia. So those are time bound. Um, complications they can occur early so it's difficult actually to to say what how do they um when do they come in this other medical complications so i just uh, place them here they they also uh, pertain to certain organ systems and at the same time uh they could be they could come in early but like pressure ulcers it's a little bit later complication. We all know that pressure ulcers are bed sores due to inadequate turning of the patient, especially if this patient does not just have traumatic brain injury, but also spinal cord injury. So what is the solution for this? Solution for pressure ulcers, we all know uh, adequate turning and um, uh, the mattress or maybe um, um, intermittent um, uh, pressure mattress. Okay, so this one, alter alternating pressure mattress. And, and in even more uh, advanced um, centers, they have a lot of um, ways to, to turn the patient, even uh, beds that are not, that are designed for this to prevent pressure ulcers. 
So next one is I already mentioned this, infections, which can actually lead to post-traumatic meningitis, which can actually lead to another complication later on, uh, could be hydrocephalus. And then complications very common in patients who are um, admitted to the hospital, they become immunocompromised because of, of the trauma is that pneumonia. And of course, if you do not do not uh, take care of that uh, catheter, you can have urine, urinary tract infection. Pneumonia can stem from either the primary aspiration pneumonia uh, when the patient um, had the accident for example, the patient had alcohol uh, uh, intake, so the patient vomited So, as, uh, during the accident, so patient can already come in early, early in the uh, course with aspiration pneumonia. But again, later in the course, could be ventilator-acquired pneumonia. So this can progress and cause sepsis, and you have uh, headaches. Well, headaches, they can range from... Uh, patients who had mild um, traumatic brain injury, which I, I mentioned earlier, is that concussion can actually lead to headaches, uh, chronic headaches later on. Okay, So vertigo also, uh, especially if there is damage to the cerebellar areas or maybe even uh, petrous uh, fractures. And then seizures. Okay, seizures. If we take a look at the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. Uh, there is not really a high level of evidence for prophylactic anticonvulsants. But we all know that a certain uh, seizures could be a dreaded complication of traumatic brain injury. So, But they also recommended in, in that uh, guidelines is that when you have a lot of intraparenchymal um, lesions, then you may need really to have uh, the, the anticonvulsants early on. But again, evidence says that only the early onset seizures could be controlled or could decrease the incidence of early onset seizures with prophylactic anticonvulsants. And late uh, onset seizures, we don't know. We don't have any evidence that it could be controlled when you give prophylactic anticonvulsants, okay? And here, of course, seizures and then post-traumatic epilepsy, meaning it progresses to uh, uh, the condition already that we call epilepsy. So fatigue, this is a very vague term, but uh, a lot of patients who went through uh, accidents could experience this, this, and this can actually be related to maybe depression, maybe post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? Then bladder and bowel dysfunction. This is um, explanatory, especially if the patients uh, um, had a lot of intraparenchymal lesions um, and even spinal cord dysfunction. So deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. This can happen in patients who are um, more bedridden. Okay. Complications. So even hypopituitarism. This can happen if there's trauma to the to to the pituitary gland. Uh, this can increase the chance of depression and fatigue, as I mentioned. Then you have blood vessel damage. This is self-explanatory. When you have um, uh, brain damage, of course, this can lead to stroke later on. Uh, you can have, as I mentioned, hydrocephalus. Okay, so hydrocephalus uh, has an incidence the incidence of post-traumatic hydrocephalus is very wide range, can be 0.7 to 45 or even 51%, as uh, a lot of studies have, um, have shown. Okay, so cranial nerve damage, of course, you have your paralysis of the facial muscle, especially if you have, um, uh, uh, if you hit the, the area of um, the entrance in, in, into the, into the pituitary area. Okay, so you can even have delayed uh, paralysis uh, depending on what kind of fracture you had in the in the basal skull in the pituitary bone. Okay, whether it's translate uh, it's um, uh, across or it's within the within the um, the axis. Okay, so you can have altered taste or smell. A lot of patients complain, especially if those patients who had anterior 
skull base fractures, they lose uh, the sense of smell. And usually this is uh, related to the taste. So impaired vision, difficulty of swallowing, difficulty of swallowing usually stem due to uh, a lot of um, this, uh, disruption of the nerves near the brainstem area. And then tinnitus and hearing loss uh, also due to uh, the, the injury to the eighth nerve. So degenerative brain diseases, increased risk of Parkinson's, dementia, and Alzheimer's. So as the previous lecturer, Professor uh, Gares has uh, mentioned, uh, it's a little bit difficult to, when you have traumatic brain injury and there's already Parkinson's, of course, um, this could come in both. We all know like uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, repeated um, injury to the brain due to the to his profession. So he developed Parkinson's later on. And this can actually be chronic traumatic encephalopathy also as uh, mentioned, uh, as termed as dementia pugilistica or boxer's dementia, okay? So they already identified this before that uh, boxers could have uh, dementia later on because of repeated injury or trauma to the brain. And then you have your sleep disturbances which is insomnia or even post-traumatic hypersomnia. Uh, what, what I mean is that um, hypersomnia uh, increased sleeping time. Patient would be just uh, sleeping a lot. Th th this could be due to possible depression or uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but also lack of sleep. Okay, Insomnia, patient could not sleep anymore. Okay, So it goes from, from one, one uh, pole to the other extreme. So this uh, last two complications are uh, the extremes, you know, coma and brain death. Solutions. Okay, so solutions, you have your medical solutions, as I mentioned, like antibiotics and medical decompression. So, um, and uh, for CSF leaks, you have your uh, lumbar drains, or if it's not controlled, then you have to operate and plug that leak. And operative, as I mentioned, with post-traumatic hydrocephalus, depending on uh, if you see that it does, uh, the patient does not have any infections, then you can um, go and uh, directly do a ventricular peritoneal shunting or an EVD if there is post-traumatic meningitis um, or ventriculitis. And then uh, neuroprotection or neurorehabilitation and in, in, in what they call solutions, because now they're identifying a lot because of the, these biomarkers, they're identifying a lot of what happens during the time of, of injury, okay? So they, they have um, the neuroprotection uh, at the early onset of injury, and they also have um, medications now uh, that they are testing, and some already have evidences uh, when it comes to the time of uh, neurorehabilitation or neurogenesis. Okay, so this is an article, Post-Traumatic Hydrocephalus. Um, it says here uh, with um, uh, uh, as a summary of, of this article, which was done in, in Sweden uh, just recently. So they had post-traumatic ventricular megaly in around 46% of their patients, which, which is actually within the range of what I mentioned earlier as uh, patients uh, having post-traumatic hydrocephalus. But only 29 or 3.5% of these patients received a ventricular peritoneal shunt okay, in, in their experience. So not all of them can actually be shunted. So depending on the indication, if they're... Um, uh, 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 pressure is high enough to warrant a shunt. Usually they recommend if it is consistently more than 180 millimeters uh, uh, water, centimeters water, I'm sorry. Okay, so altogether uh, with this discussion that they showed here, a lot of these patients actually did not recover well because it showed that these patients had hydrocephalus and they in fact did not just recover well, but they deteriorated in consciousness. So meaning they later on actually had to have a shunt. So altogether, according to them, 19 or 66% of post-traumatic hydrocephalus patients 
improved after shunt surgery. So it has to be um, a very wise decision to be able to address post-traumatic ventriculomegaly or post-traumatic hydrocephalus. Okay, so neurorestoration in traumatic brain injury, as I mentioned, uh, as a solution, there's a lot of um, articles already that, and they still keep on doing a lot of experiments in this aspect. So, because not all of this, a lot of patients actually need not have any surgery. Okay, so what can you offer to these patients aside from controlling the edema and making sure that the secondary brain injury is, is, is prevented? So later on in, in rehabilitation, patients have uh, cognitive deficits, patients have affective disorders, patients have um, chronic headache. So they still say that a lot of neurorestoration and neurorehabilitation can still happen during these times. So a lot of experiments and papers are still being conducted addressing these different modes of um, different uh, medications that could address neurorestoration, neurorehabilitation, and neurogenesis in traumatic brain injury. So pearls to take home is that, uh, okay, traumatic brain injury happened, we need to recognize what can we prevent? What can we prevent to complicate the already primary injury in the patient? So recognition also of possible um, complications and reassessment of the patient, meaning even if you discharge the patient, strictly the patient should follow up, especially if the patients have possibility of developing hydrocephalus, post-traumatic hydrocephalus, those patients who had subarachnoid hemorrhages, reassess them and be able to catch them early on to be able to address uh, the complication. Meaning a lot of patients, they're undergoing rehab and it's, it seems that this patient is not progressing or improving. So what could have happened? So a repeat scan may be warranted and voila, maybe a post-traumatic hydrocephalus is there. All you need to do is shunt for the patient to again improve. Okay, and then, yeah, as I said, remedy and referral. For example, referral, what I mean by referral, of course, multidisciplinary management, which is very essential actually in neurotrauma. The multidisciplinary management does not just involve rehabilitation, new rehab, but also assessment of the cognitive deficits. There are a lot of, um, neurologists who are addressing these cognitive deficits to be able to detect whether these patients are already having dementia or Alzheimer's or even Parkinson's. Okay, so with this, I would like to thank everyone for their attention. And I would, even if it's very early, <laughs> I would just now uh, announce that we are hosting in Manila, Philippines, the 2026 Asian Austral Asian Congress in Neurosurgery. So if you're interested to volunteer to become a speaker or later on, we will have our website, um, please email me. Again, a privilege to be here and thank you so much, everyone, for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Madam, for the amazing lecture and uh, for sparing time from your busy schedule today. I know you've been so busy today, and uh, I, I would I was so worried. I was thinking that oh my God, I have disturbed you from uh, from a lot of things. And but uh, again, thank you very much, and uh, I really appreciate your dedication for education because you are really very active and sharing really amazing knowledge. And uh, like I've uh, been listening to all of your lectures that you always correlated so well with the clinical the actual scenarios that we deal with and it's like um it's not like outpouring of uh, mere knowledge it is like correlating an application in the real life as well so i think all these lectures will be extremely helpful for all those who are practicing neurosurgery and those especially the trainees if they come up with this and like you have very nicely mentioned i've been listening to you that it is important for us to have this idea that this patient with a certain condition can develop that certain complications and we need to have a have an eye on that patient that he might be developing that uh, sort of complication like you have mentioned the hydrocephalus you have to be very careful about that patient and you have to actually educate their uh, their family about it and i think the similar is when we have this idea that that patient might be, 
be suffering from post TBIC or an epilepsy, we should be very, very careful about them. And we need to tell their uh, families about that they might be developing this type of a complication. So keep an eye on this. And if this happens, please do let us know and uh, do uh, take your medications and everything that we need to tell them about. So again, Madam, thank you very much for this very elaborate talk. And I know that you have a very, okay. very short time. Yeah, sorry. I, can, I, can I just, uh, again, Anna, sorry, I, I forgot. Uh, June 7, 8, and 9, we have a three-day uh, neurotrauma boot camp uh, in the Philippines. But it, this will be broadcasted uh Ooh virtually also. So we have like, we're eyeing 150 to 200 face-to-face -face participants. We have speakers from the Asian Australasian, uh, both um, virtually and also physically. And we have other invited speakers from other parts of uh, other societies. So um, I will come up with, um, we have already have posters. We're finalizing the program, but it's a three-day seminar, which we will broadcast, we, we will broadcast uh, virtually. Oh, amazing. That would be so kind of you, madam. I'll be waiting for you to share yes. the flyers and I will be happy to circulate it among friends and colleagues so that they can all actually get the benefit from your knowledge and your organization. It, it is actually <laughs> a very comprehensive uh, program in neurotrauma, which uh, stems from our advocacy and uh, uh, want for education for, for uh, this kind of um, seminars. Okay, So it's uh, from injury to recovery. Oh, that will be very, very, yes. very comprehensive in, in wrapping all the, those aspects that, that are important in this. And I think that it's, uh, well, I, when I see these things, I see the patient, I always think that we actually need to cover uh, from the very, uh, all the aspects, like we should actually start for prevention and then management. And after that, we should look for complications and also the rehab of the patient. And sometimes we overlook this type of, uh, you know, these phases that are important. And uh, we just jump into that, oh, how can we, can, can we operate this patient? Oh, no, we cannot operate this. We cannot do it because we're ready to hit upset and go bye-bye. And it's like that. So I think that you, that you have done a, an amazing job. And I think women are doing so much amazing in neurosurgery. I feel so proud. And I, I'm, I'm constantly learning from all of your amazing ladies and gentlemen and everyone who is in neurosurgery and who's dedicated. But um, there's a, an interesting question because um, um, I've uh, there's a lot of research and there is a lot of uh, paradoxical data regarding the occurrence uh, the, regarding TBI as a risk factor for meningioma formation. So what do you really think about it? But uh, in fact, you know, uh, in my own practice, I have seen patients who have told me, even in gliomas, that they had a history of head injury. So, and sometimes the theories are very, very, uh, the one if you just uh, go and do your own logic, it seems a little logical that there might be a trauma and leading to neuroinflammatory cascade and, you know, free radical formations and uh, proliferation of cells. And it could be some sort of like uh, in, uh, arachnoidal capsules can probably proliferate and can undergo and if you it, it is not well um, uh, in a negative feedback and does not go uh, and it does go uncontrolled and more towards proliferation it can happen so what's your view regarding tbi as a factor for any type of brain tumor formation uh, so far in, in all the in a lot of uh, studies there is not just um when we say maybe um remotely uh, what, what to say is the meningioma but um, it's not related actually, but uh, if you take a look at the, the readings, uh, they say they had a history of trauma. They usually yes. mention it when, when, when you ask it, okay, the patient comes in for you with the, with the meningioma, and then they usually say, uh, doctor, was it related when I had this uh, trauma? You know, like, uh, mm -hmm. so if you take um, a look at them, sometimes it's a question mark, you know, we yeah. all know, that we don't know the cause of meningioma really yet, as per se, like <laughs> virus or trauma or whatever. But uh, it's it's there, it's it's mentioned in, in, in the history of the patient when you talk to them, okay? So, but it's it, it's not really, we all know that there's no evidence for that. 
exactly because I, I what i've been seeing in here and there was even a case report that i came across a few days ago that they have mentioned the patient had a calcified meningioma at the same site where he had acquired a skull fracture a linear skull fracture uh that he, that he had uh, several years ago so it's like a, a topic of a, um uh a dip, something uh, more of a research and like you have mentioned there is no evidence there are more theories and uh but yes, is, yes. yours and maybe uh, you said a, a case report so it's very rare very rare exactly but th there are patients like you also mentioned that i've also noticed that um who share that they had a history of uh, head injury so it's it's a little interesting sometimes to see uh that uh, this is happening uh so again so madam thank you very very much for this amazing talk and everyone really enjoyed it and i have got a lot of feedback for you and uh, um so many messages that have come with me that uh you uh, about you that professor lini really delivers amazing lectures and um again thank you very very much i've been following your talks uh, for a very long time and we've all been intrigued so again thank you very much madam i don't think we are going to hold you for so long because i know that you are still you. busy somewhere thank you again and uh it's a pleasure to be here good night and uh, good morning good day Thank you so much, Madam. Thank you so much again. And the pleasure and honor is all ours. Again, thanks. And I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> And, and uh, all the attendees, I have shared the link to download your path to certificate. So kindly um, use that link. I share it again in the chat box so you can just download your uh, certificate right now and just um, uh, send me. When you click on this link, an access uh, uh, request will be sent to me, which I will be able to accept and give it to you. So again, uh, thank you very much for attending our webinar today. We are going to hold a very, to, to introduce our new series of Masters of Neurosurgery. And we are pleased to invite you, I'm pleased to invite you to our next webinar on 31st match, which will be with Professor Miguel Rice, and uh, he will be delivering a lecture on the brain stem uh, tumor approaches. So again, uh, I'm looking forward to welcoming you to that next uh, webinar. I have already received your access uh, request on my on my email. So I'll be giving you um, all these accesses. It might take a little time. And so just be patient and to keep uh, rechecking for access. And all those of you who have attended both part one and part two, just please let me know and give me, send me an email and I will be, I will give you a special certificate for uh trauma trauma for uh, for this uh, uh head injury awareness webinar um attendance certificate it will be a special one for those who have received both of the parts again thank you very very much and i'm looking forward to welcoming you again on 31st match and after that on 14th match and obviously there will be a lecture with professor um Juha Hanis Niami and all and we will also continue with our vascular neurosurgery series with Professor Lenzino from Mary Clinic. Uh thank you very much, Maria. Thanks for a perfect webinar. Thank you very much. Maneha, thank you again for the much for the much great webinar. Greeting from Libya. Greeting from Pakistan as well to Libya. Again, thank you very much. It's so nice to see you. Thank you, Elma. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arunis. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Ernest. I have just sent you the the access permission. Your email was the one I've been looking at. So again, thank you very, very, very much. So I'm so looking forward to welcoming you you again, and it's so nice to see you all from different parts of the world. Um, and the text to Zoom, we are coming together.